Hi, my name is Chris Brennan, and you're listening to the Astrology Podcast. This is episode 201, and today we're going to be talking about uh, some of the uh, advantages and some of the pitfalls of dating another astrologer. So joining me today is my partner, Lisa Scheim, and we are joined today by our first uh, other couple to do our first four-person in podcast uh, podcast episode with Eugenia Kroc and uh, Tarek Goheim. Goheim, yeah. Goheim. Uh, so thanks for joining me today, guys. Yeah. Thanks it's for having us. Just so exciting. So Eugenia, this is actually your second appearance on the podcast episode. We just realized that you joined me the last time about one year ago, right? Yeah, right before I went to Egypt. Yeah. Right. So that was right, be- literally right before you, you had you had started. You two had started dating what a few months before that. Oh no! How long no, have you been back together? A while now, doesn't it, sweetie? Yeah. Um. What, you know, you know the dates. Oh gosh! Well, because we met through the internet mm-hmm. through astrology. Okay. Uh, we met technically almost three years ago. Was it two thousand sixteen? Mm-hmm. Okay. And I saw, well, we saw each other around the internet for a long time, even before that. So kind and, of, you know, like how people see each other in cafes. Right. And you, of course, do the Accessible Astrology podcast, right? I do. Okay. Yes. And that's at, what's your URL again? Yeah, ex- accessibleastrology.com. Okay. Yeah. Perfect. Um, and how long have you both been studying astrology? 10 years. About eight years. I'm a junior, aren't I, compared to you? <laughs> About eight years? Eight years, yes. Okay. Mm-hmm. That's not too much too much of a difference. That's no. pretty good because that's one issue can, that can come up sometimes that we'll be talking about is like, you know, parody in terms of how long you've been studying. Right. right. Yeah, we, we've, we've been quite aligned, haven't we, considering we've got the same chart. Yeah. So Right. So that's one of the funny things about you two is you have the same, almost the exact same degree of the ascendant, right? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, I'm 28 it's... degrees, 59 minutes Gemini, and you are 29. Yes, so we're one minute different. Wow! So we are actually the same person. Uh, <laughs> right. Luckily, that makes it easier. <laughs> yeah, luckily there's a male and female version. <laughs> yeah, or I like that. Luckily, sometimes. <laughs> yeah, it's uh, definitely where the uh, chemistry is, isn't it? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, and the twins, and you have the same shirt. I like that. <laughs> shirt. I know. I've got a thermal shirt at the moment because I'm in Colorado. Okay, <laughs> to keep warm. <laughs> Yeah. So, um, all right. So today we're going to be talking about I, I, you know, last weekend, uh, Tarek, you gave a talk uh, oh, yes. for the local astrology group for the Denver Astrology Group on the Jupiter Saturn cycle, um, and we really enjoyed that. And we were sitting around afterwards, and um, you know, I've recently just started built the podcast studio, and we just moved into this place. So I wanted to have another couple of astrologers over to experiment with doing a four person episode, and I just got the idea. One thing I was trying to think of, like what we all share in common, or what would be something we could all talk about that we have experience with, and it was unique. I realized that we're both couples that are, um, you know, astrologers, where we're all astrologers, and there's something unique about that because I think most people, I know there's a lot of people that are astrology enthusiasts or even professional astrologers who are in relationships with have a significant other that's not an astrologer necessarily, and so it's not. A given that just because you're an astrologer or an enthusiast or even a professional astrologer, that you're definitely going to date another astrologer. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Um, and in, in addition to that, people sometimes that that don't have that might like kind of idealize what that would be like, or if they've never had that, they might think it would be all great. But of course, as with anything, there's going to be some pros and some cons. Yeah. So that's a little bit of what I wanted to talk about today. Yeah. Um, what was what else? Where else do we start with this kind of broad topic? Um, let's see. Well, I guess you you ask them how long have you been studying astrology? Right. Yeah. So fifteen years for me. Okay, and it's been about nineteen years for me, or twenty years. Mm-hmm. Wow. So not terribly different. Yeah. 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 You, a little bit longer. Similar lengths, yeah. I think, and yeah, and so I'm trying to think of some of the other topics, though. So mm-hmm. so there's that. Um, are you guys similar ages? Mm. I'm a bit older than you, aren't I? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Okay. I think it's a similar age difference. Mm. Similar. I think mm. we're a bit a bit more of a gap. But. Mm. Mm-hmm. Okay. Yeah. And Lisa's older than I am. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Although most people don't know that or think yeah. it's the reverse. Right. Exactly. Actually, <laughs> people right. usually guess the reverse. I think that's not that different with you and I. Yeah, we um we've had that, haven't we? Yeah. We seem we look the same, mm-hmm. same age. Mm-hmm. So right. you know we kind of have this. Uh, 
doesn't matter about the age, does it really? But I am older than you. Yeah. What, eight years? I think it's eight years, yeah. Okay. Mm-hmm. Okay. Yeah. Um, so where do we start in terms of our outlines? So uh, there are a bunch of points. I'm trying to think if there's any like precursors that we need to lay down though first. Um, that this isn't a tell-all. <laughs> yeah, so we're not going we're not going to yes. everything. This is not disclaimer like, here. This is yeah. not an privacy policy. Right. Yeah. Uh, that's a good point. Yeah. Um, so we're talking about the larger issue, really, not really just like laying out our relationships bare per se. Yeah, we, 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 I think we're all very brave for doing this right now. Yeah. <laughs> Actually, yeah. <laughs> you know, coming on and uh, obviously we met through astrology, didn't we? You mm-hmm. know, in our story, it's definitely a huge part of our relationship, isn't that? Yeah, it's the the cornerstone of. I mean, it's the central focus of our relationship. C- considering mm-hmm. that um, I'm from England, um, first born parents Egyptian mm-hmm. and likewise Eugenia is a well I'm a Polish immigrant yeah and uh but we come from incredibly incredibly different backgrounds and it's astrology that miraculously brought us together like I find it I when I think about it I think it's a miracle oftentimes that two people with such insanely different not just backgrounds, but maybe even what we thought would have been trajectories. Somehow we found each other because of the internet yeah. um, and that, that deep love for astrology and, and that we can come back to that all the time. Right. So it's, it's definitely a huge part of our story. Right. right. There's no way we would have met if it wasn't for the internet and, and we're having a shared interest in astrology. Yeah. Where did you guys meet? So it was on the forum, wasn't it? Yeah, we met originally. Uh, so I was an astrologer for Kaipacha. I don't know. Do you know him? Yeah, he's like a he's a big astrologer on YouTube. Yes, I was yeah. part of his dream team for a while. Okay, and within his community, which he has an online community, uh, we we have forums and things of that where we connect in a Facebook group and things. And I that's where I saw Tark around the internet, and I would always you know kind of click. on I his was picture. hungry for knowledge. <laughs> You know, I wasn't expecting anything else. All right. <laughs> and it just sort of developed that way, didn't it? Um, yeah. Where we started chatting and we had a mutual interest in astrology. And um, I absolutely had no, no idea that Eugenie would have thought anything of me. Yeah. Um, but for some reason, the dialogue turned into meeting, didn't it, on the eclipse in America? Yeah. That That's why it. I came over. Oh, on the, like, the Great American Eclipse? Mm-hmm. So yeah. that was in the summer of what, 2017? Yeah. yeah. Okay. Yeah. yeah. So, so that was it, almost was, two years yeah. ago now? Exactly. That's the first time we met. And, um, you know, so it was all about astrology. If you think about it, how on earth would we have um, chose to meet at that time if we didn't have a shared interest? Mm -hmm. Right. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So that, so astrology definitely brought you together. And then it's something that you're still able to share as like a continued interest and a continued language. Cause that's something that um, I know astrologers, astrology tends to be kind of like an isolated study where not a lot of people get that far into it or go into it with that much depth. Mm And then um, it's hard sometimes, except for online, you can meet other astrologers nowadays Mm -hmm. over the past decade or two with social media. But in terms of like in-person meetings, like sometimes you'll find a local astrology group if you're lucky. But that's one of the reasons that a lot of astrologers end up going to conferences is to like meet and have that personal in-person connection with other astrologers. And I always hear them reporting this thing about suddenly being able to speak the same language with somebody else as that Mm -hmm. being like a real core almost like primal need that astrologers have that often often isn't fulfilled in some way yeah uh, but then when you end up getting into a relationship with another astrologer that's one part of it that's sort of fulfilling in in some ways mm-hmm. absolutely i mean i think i mean there's no doubt about it so i'm a bit hot here you know I'm, that's okay you know, <laughs> um, i know you are uh, thanks, <laughs> it's not just about astrology right <laughs> let's just remember that um but yeah i mean um there's no doubt about it our dialogue has been we've learned so much about astrology yeah. together yeah. by having that mutual interest and reflective kind of um, communication, especially during transits. Right, which mm-hmm. I think we'll talk more specifically yeah. about. Sure. But I think, yeah, I, I know for myself, I when I first learned astrology, I had two people I could consistently speak with about it. Mm-hmm. Uh, and that was it. Mm-hmm. So for... 
so if we're talking so seven years and then I found you guys, which we think it was like four or five years ago Mm -hmm. and little by little that started to shift. And then of course, when I um, was part of the community, that was really helpful, but I felt like I was in a desert for seven years, Mm -hmm. just having, especially in relationships, I would be with a boyfriend and he, he would say something like, this is a really bad day. Yeah. There's an eclipse happening. Okay. No, like there's an eclipse happening. It's happening on your Mars right now or whatever. Mm, yeah. Well, uh, okay. And, and it just, and I'd have to try to educate the partner. And mm-hmm. it was very exhausting for me. And because it's one thing to try to say, hey, this is a transit affecting you right now. It's a whole nother thing for them to believe that. And the the part, the relationships I had prior to Tarek, I they did not believe in astrology mm. almost avidly, which I thought was kind of difficult. I mean, that's difficult when you really believe in something and right. your partner doesn't. And I don't think that's just astrology. That's, uh, yeah, I think, any relationship. If someone believes in the right versus the left, they're mm-hmm. less likely to be in relationship with each other, right. for example. Yeah, like any huge part of your own worldview. You know, different people yeah. prioritize different pieces of things as to what's most important to share in a relationship. Yeah. But worldview is often like a huge one, yes. whether that's religion, politics, you know, or astrology. Exactly. Um, yeah. And, you know, you're touching on something that seems like, you know, there's two different levels. There's having an, a relationship with an astrologer versus someone who doesn't know astrology, but then might be open to it versus right. someone who like actively doesn't value yeah. it or thinks that it, there's nothing to it, which is a whole different thing. It is. Yeah. yeah. And that might be worth asking. So have we all both been in both situations in terms of like being in, in a relationship now with an astrologer versus being in a relationship with somebody who isn't an astrologer? Yeah. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Like we've all done yeah. both sides of that. I mean, I think when you're an astrologer and you're really passionate about it and you believe it and people believe in you, you know, there's a lot of value in that study and um, there's not the questions that sometimes happen often where people don't believe it and then why are you spending so much time doing that? You might be in the situation with that with somebody who doesn't study or doesn't know astrology. Hopefully they love you enough to value what you do and they don't judge you. But being with an actual astrologer, working those things out, there's the same language, isn't there? There's yeah. the same understanding of cycles and just the obviousness of how astrology works. Yeah, I mean, and that can be. I mean, maybe we should touch on that first, since that was maybe where we all started. I'm sure because everybody's probably here. We all initially started being in relationships with non astrologers, mm-hmm. and then eventually we're in our current relationships, and those have been a little bit more successful, partially probably due to that. So um, it's tricky though because I don't want to like. I know there's listeners. There's plenty of astrologers in the community, and I know a lot of astrologers have met at conferences or close friends who. Sometimes they got into astrology um, after they'd been in a relationship for a long time or after they were mm-hmm. already married. And so they've already formed mm-hmm. this like lifelong partnership. And then they start studying this, you know, kind of quasi weird occult, quasi occult mm-hmm. um, topic. I mean, let's be honest, you know, astrology is still kind of weird. Like, even though we all use it, even though we, we know that it works. Um, it's still, at least for me, it's consistently like surprising how well it works and that it should work at all. Mm-hmm. And if we're realistic, like I could see how if you're somebody that like is in a relationship and then suddenly you start studying astrology, that could look really weird or could be hard for your partner if they don't get as interested in it or it doesn't like grab them the same way. Yeah. Yeah, I would definitely think so. I mean, luckily, like I haven't, you know, since I started studying astrology, I never had the experience of, you know, being with someone who was actively like, you know, you shouldn't be into that. Mm. Um, yeah, but it, it, I could see it easily coming up. Have either of you been in a relationship where it was like they, your partner was actively antagonistic towards astrology? Yes. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, I've been there too. Mm. What, what yeah. was that like? Do you- yeah, well, for me, it was... Uh, I think I was in two more serious relationships in those seven years that I would consider significant. Uh, And those two, one of them thought I was just a good salesperson. And he said, this is, you're just good at sales. And I, that was tough. That was very, very. What uh, what does that mean? Good at sales? I can convince someone to believe in something that's not real. Mm. Okay, like so he's sp- like snake oil. Yeah. So he's he was of the the version because that's like a version of the astrology. A lot of skeptics make that argument where they say that 
astrology is fake and astrologers are just duping people yeah. or they think that astrologers themselves don't believe it and yeah. that instead they're just trying to convince other people that it's real when it's not. But in yeah. fact, that's one of the things that I always thought if a skeptic actually genuinely looked into astrology and looked into the astrological community or knew anything about it, they would realize really quickly that like 99.9% of astrologers all think that astrology is like a, a valid, legitimate phenomenon. Mm -hmm. yeah. and, and they're not like actively trying to deceive mm -hmm. anyone because they are daily mm -hmm. incorporating it into their lives. Right. Mm -hmm. It's a value thing, isn't it? I think if you're with a non astrologer or somebody who doesn't value the amount of time you're putting into it and, and money as well. Mm -hmm. Then they may see that as be used better somewhere else. Mm -hmm. Straight away, you're in a difficult position in a relationship. Straight away, then aren't you? Because mm -hmm. there's a conflict of interests or of respect of what you're interested in and what they see as what you should be or judgment. Mm -hmm. Right. Yeah. And I was going to ask Eugenia, like, was the relationship you were in was were you already studying astrology when you got into it, or mm -hmm. did you get into it after? Being... No, I was already yeah okay. deep into client work and. So they kind of knew going into it then mm -hmm. theoretically or should have known, but yeah. they maybe it was something where they thought you would get over it or something like that. Or Right. And I think he he thought it was like this cute Colorado girl thing, right? He wasn't from here. And he I think assumed it was just this cute a cute thing, mm -hmm. really. Mm -hmm. And when we would get in arguments on say a full moon or something, I would mention it <laughs> and uh he didn't have the space to listen. And then <laughs> The relationship I had, the other one that was significant, he listened, but it could, he, it didn't land. Mm -hmm. And he was a, a very earthbound human. And so he felt very uncomfortable every time I encouraged him to think up, right? Because he was a you know mountain biker and, you know, a typical like, Colorado, you know, I'm in the mountains and I hunt and I bike, which is great, uh, whatever. Uh, but his every time I would encourage him to think beyond the earth, it really physically made him uncomfortable to even look up, literally, mm -hmm. uh, which I've actually found with a lot of people since I've become an astrologer. I say, why aren't you interested? I just, I can't, I can't think of us not being on this planet, you know, that we're in space floating, mm -hmm. right? Like some people find that actually very nervous hmm. and he was one of those people so i would try but it just wouldn't land so he was open to it for, to, to me loving it but hmm. in terms of his reception of it it was almost impossible it hmm. just didn't land at him so hmm. I, it got a bit exhausting not being able to say okay well this is an eclipse and just him being like i don't know i'm sorry that just doesn't sure. make sense right mm -hmm. and that i mean that actually connects with one of the questions we got on twitter um, that is related to that. Where, and this is from at Academic Astro, where she said, slightly off topic, but as a straight woman, how do I explain my level of interest in astrology to men I date? Most men I have dated have had harsh preconceptions about it. So in relationships, I end up downplaying my interest, but feel misunderstood in the process. Mm -hmm. And I think that's um, relevant because it goes back to something we've also talked about in episodes not too long ago about the apparent at least gender disparity where there seems to be more women who are into astrology than men mm -hmm. and then sometimes in other fields like in stem fields there's like more men that tend to be at least currently at the present moment in time into those or sometimes in the skeptic community there's more of a preponderance of men that are into skepticism and i, I can imagine that that would be really hard if you were trying to date and astrology was like your thing and you're just like running into people who are at the very least or like best not best case scenario but let's say moderately worst case scenario is just like actively disinterested versus or passively disinterested versus actively antagonistic towards mm -hmm. um that would be really tough mm -hmm. well and i would say to this individual similar to what Tarek was just saying i think when <laughs> this is something danielle my previous co-host of of the of my podcast used to say, or she still tells me this all the time, when values are clear, decisions are easy. Mm -hmm. And I think for me, I, 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 won't, I wouldn't say I was like out to find an astrologer uh, necessarily, but I knew after those relationships that I love this thing called astrology and it's not I also hate it. It's that it's like a relationship being with astrology being with astrology as a profession, as a passion, it's good and bad, right? There's good days with astrology and bad days with astrology, like everything else. But I knew that this was such a, a core value to me that it would be 
advantageous to have a partner who understood this language. And so in a way I was sort of looking and, and I did, I, I, in these communities, I did spot Tarek in his face on Facebook. It wasn't just the chart. It wasn't. <laughs> right. You didn't see the chart first. Well, like, yeah. Yeah, that is a yeah, I wasn't like, like resumes out. So for yeah. charts. Yeah. That is a sexy chart. Yeah. <laughs> um, have yeah. you seen it, Chris? Uh, I mean, no. <laughs> right. Yeah. No, it was. I was. I thought. Oh gosh, he's very cute, and, and he it, likes astrology. And this think, is crazy. And also, think about it. It wasn't the time that we're living in right now. It's not just um, the social media that exists, isn't there? So you you, you see somebody, you like them. Mm -hmm. You might look on their Facebook, Instagram. Mm -hmm. There's all these stories that are now connected, which in some ways connected to how we met, you know, through mm -hmm. online. Yeah. You know, it's like, I think a lot of young people these days um, would look at someone's profile mm -hmm. and suddenly there's a whole story about them. Yeah. And then, sure. and yet, you know, with astrology, you know, it's like you can suddenly look at even deeper elements, can't you? Yeah. I mean, if you see that chart, I mean, everybody, that's the first thing every astrologer wants, to, whether you're dating or not, like yeah. you, everyone wants to see somebody they just met their chart because that gives yeah. you an additional level of insight or at least an additional angle of understanding who this person is that you just met right. and perhaps even how they might be connected to your life in some way. And how to right. communicate yeah. with them. Right. Right. And that seems like that was a topic that came up a lot in the um, questions that um, people were sending in as far as like how much to balance like looking at the chart versus interacting with the person and not uh -huh. like equating the two. Right. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yes, because that was also our personal story is that we met and at some point like you gave me your data and I saw that you had like almost the same chart as my ex-girlfriend right. who I just got a very difficult relationship with oh, and, no. and that was like very... That was very off-putting to me. Like I have to be honest. Like initially, yeah, I remember. I was like, she seems very nice, but now I'm now I'm extremely nervous. Right. Um, you yeah. know about the chart, and that was a good actually lesson for me though, because then like surprise, surprise, it's like ten years later, and we're still together. That you yeah. can't just make assumptions about people based on their chart as like um, completely unconditional either like rejections or what have you, you've got to get to know the person and you've got to see how they're actually living some of those placements. And mm -hmm. that's really going to vary from person to person based on a whole host of conditions. But that's that might be a lesson that's like challenging or, or that some astrologers have to learn because part of us learning astrology at first is learning what placements mean what and assuming mm -hmm. there's more of a one-to-one -one correspondence. But then at mm -hmm. some point when you get to the more advanced levels, you have to realize there might be more flexibility to some extent than you might anticipate. Yeah, and that there's variety, even even though the snapshot of the chart does show you some things about how the person might be or what kind of personality they have or what have you, but um, there's still variety within each and every one of those placements. Mm -hmm. And totally. so then when you combine all of the placements, even if you share then a few of them with like an ex or you know with someone else you've known, it's still a totally different person. Absolutely, so. right. And I mean, actually, we both had that, like, um, because the relationship I had just gotten out of, we had almost the same placements in a few no. different things. Yeah. It was like the yeah. same sun and moon or same something Same sun bizarre. and moon within a degree, same Venus no. almost, like same Mercury. So, um, yeah. Uh, so that was kind of crazy that we both had that going on at the same time. But I was just less off put because I was, it was not a bad relationship I'd gotten out of. So. Right. 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 It yeah. was a lovely relationship. <laughs> yeah. or, it was a <laughs> fine relationship. <laughs> yeah. Um, Your placements are lovely. <laughs> I was still having like PTSD from <laughs> there you go. getting out of. Yeah. It's, it's all conditioning, isn't it? Past conditioning and it creates these uh, these perceptions that might be completely, you know, not the, not the case with a new person that comes along. Yeah. Yeah. And, and to be fair, like the charts obviously weren't exactly the same. There was just right. major elements where we immediately as astrologers recognize similarities yeah. uh, with those placements, but then the rest of the charts just completely different. Yeah. Mm. So it's not like you're dating like an astro twin necessarily, but <laughs> right. that in of itself is interesting seeing, you know, as astrologers, you immediately will recognize some either similar placements with other people in your life 
and have that question about like why is that placement repeating with this person mm -hmm. or sometimes you'll your eye will immediately be drawn to like the sinistry you have with that person yeah right and you know that's you know you guys have that's one of the greatest like examples i can think of is like having almost the exact same ascendant degree is just almost bizarre like Within minutes or at least half an hour, we're having exactly the same experience. Aren't we, sweetheart? <laughs> and actually, I mean, that's the reality, isn't yeah, it? Yeah. And the more we get to know each other, we, in our history and things of that nature, which, right, you can't learn from a chart. It just, mm. it just takes mm -hmm. time to learn these things. Right. Is uh, we are recognizing that, wow, we, you know, our, our interaction with our families, same. Mm. Uh, the way we even handle like money and things of that nature, really similar. Uh, the way we, we deal with our home, very similar. Mm. Uh, and then things will happen just by our, mm. the events of our life. And it is, it's almost shocking how rhythmic, you know, when we're in England, Tark ends up in the place he went to college here. We just ended up in the place I went to college, you know, kind of randomly. And mm. so somehow we've now both seen where we spent our time in well, university. I mean, it's very simple being in a relationship like this. If I do anything wrong, then I'm going to feel that. And exactly the same with you. <laughs> yeah. Likewise, positive. So if we worked out to always be positive, we wouldn't be in a, in a realistic relationship though, would we? You know, in sure. the sense that. It's the karma, you could say, of, of our experiences match so quickly now. Yeah, I think it's that's very what That's what I'm trying to say. You know, I'm trying to say that dating an astrologer, I mean, it's also Eugenia as well. Sure. So, I mean, you know, it's more than just an astrologer. Right. But the point, the point I'm making is that we've become so sensitive to this kind of astrological information and incorporated it and also surrendered to our own insecurities within it to become very like mirror-like with each other. Mm -hmm. So dating an astrologer, a good astrologer, and also being in love, definitely we can't hide anything, can we? No. Mm -hmm. <laughs> that, yeah. That's a consequence of this particular relationship, which is probably really good because transparency is everything in relationship. Yeah. Sure. Yeah. So that's a good point that uh, knowing the astrology, knowing your partner's charts and like what the current transits are brings a greater level of transparency than sure. you might be used to dealing with in a normal relationship. Because mm -hmm. um, I like, you're really good at tracking my transits, <laughs> <laughs> uh, even right. better than I do a lot of the time. Like you were just telling <laughs> me I was in a oh, peak, yeah. peak period or something today and yeah. I had no idea. Right. Um, but, and sometimes you've made predictions about things that would eventually happen in my life that I didn't or you anticipated <laughs> things like pretty accurately and that's one of the cool parts of having an astrologer mm. as a partner is mm -hmm. like you've got like your own private astrologer like, <laughs> yeah. like always on got you back he's yeah. got you back well, exactly yeah. or can like pull out an ephemeris at the moment's <laughs> moment's yeah. notice yeah um <laughs> Yeah, yeah, we were laughing at our in our last apartment. It's like, do we not have an ephemeris in this room? We need an ephemeris in every room, like <laughs> right. within like yeah. hands grab. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. I mean, and I think that's one of the best things about it is, you know, you can have that constant dialogue around it. Mm -hmm. Um and also just become, I think you mentioned this earlier too, become a better astrologer because of that constant dialogue. You know, whereas usually there, you have other people in your life that you can talk astrology with, but maybe not as frequently. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. Yeah. And I know that I've gotten better as an astrologer through that, like just constant back and forth. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Getting really sensitive to the energies and um, male, female mm -hmm. energies. And then again, communicating and adapting it and then recognizing how those energies look, how it's affected us both. Mm. And then having the chance to communicate about it has definitely been, has helped us, hasn't it? Oh God, yeah. Mm. I, I mean, that's yeah. interesting with you two because like using whole sign houses, a lot of your house transits would be the same. Like Jupiter mm. going through Sagittarius is like going through both of your seventh houses over yeah. the course of the past year. Yeah. Uh, but the degree-based forms of house division about hitting specific degrees will be off a bit. I mean, the ascendant is the same, so that's actually interesting. But like the degree of your midheaven, I'm guessing, is like in different signs. Different signs. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. So it's like yeah, there's a Aquarius and Pisces. Yeah. So that offsets things a bit. Mm. But one of the things that's also particularly interesting about our relationship is we have the same houses filled and the same houses empty as well. We have both of us have almost nothing in the southern part of our chart. We only have Pluto. You have Uranus. I have Saturn, and that's it. 
mm-hmm. for both of us. The mm-hmm. rest of he's everything in the seventh and the tenth, and I'm everything in the seventh and the ninth and the tenth. So it's not just the house systems, it's actually the way they're filled as well. Mm-hmm. And when I first saw his chart before he he's I saw his before he saw mine. <laughs> she had one for me. <laughs> mm-hmm. Okay. Uh my initial reaction was almost dumbfounded. Right. I, I was speechless, actually. And I of course my initial instinct was like this this could be the most profound connection because of what I'm seeing here. Mm. And then I put it away. And we didn't talk actually for at least six months after I initially saw it uh, because, um, you know, for varying reasons, but it, it was a, so an instant that I saw how similar we were more than anything. Mm-hmm. I thought this could be either really, really phenomenal or just way too hard, right? Because I'm constantly with myself. Mm-hmm. Right. And that's a really unique layer, like on top of just you being both being astrologers. Yeah. It's right. like mm-hmm. because most people who get into a relationship with another astrologer, that is already rare. Right. And then they won't usually have the same chart. So right. that's right. actually quite uncommon that you share all of that. Right. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, just to add to that, mm-hmm. you know, in terms of perception before you actually got to know somebody, mm-hmm. I think the most important thing about this conversation is that you need to get to know somebody. Mm-hmm. Right. And it's great that, you know, let's say in Vedic, I know in astrology, people would ensure that they knew each other's charts or from what I've heard in terms mm-hmm. of marriage and stuff, um, which I think is a worthwhile thing, considering that we've been through these ideas of looking at each other's charts. and mm-hmm. um, But getting to know somebody, you know, getting to feel what they feel like, because obviously right. we've had the difficulty of a transatlantic relationship, which at the end of the day, where we were born and then where we're living and where we're communicating is in different places yet we have sagittarius in our seventh Mm -hmm. with a combination of 12 planets and asteroids in our seventh in combination Mm -hmm. not from a composite chart but if we were to add up all of so it actually also makes total sense (laughs) Mm -hmm. yeah and um i think that i think what i was trying to say is that um we can make sense of things with the astrology Mm sometimes we can overcompensate for things as well or we can go that extra yard because we know it's going to get better Mm. at certain times all of that is advantageous in Mm. using astrology in relationship for sure but the actual you know you could say the birds and the bees and and the practicality of life Mm -hmm. you know it's doing that that is really going to make a relationship work right yeah Right. Yeah, definitely. And that was a topic that came up or a question that came up a lot was, and that's one of the great both um, benefits, but also disadvantages or drawbacks is um, when to incorporate astrology or when is astrology playing a healthy role in your relationship Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. versus when is it something that you're bringing in at inappropriate times or when do you need to step back from the astrology and just be present and be like human beings related to each other? Mm-hmm. Yeah, and I, I, that was kind of a component of a lot of different questions that came in. I mean, I feel like that was more of an issue for me earlier on, like in the relationship. In what sense? Um, just in the sense of that they were very separate things because we didn't know each other well yet. Mm-hmm. And so they were completely, you know, this this chart and then, you know, this relationship. And I feel like now both just having been an astrologer for so much longer, as well as being in the relationship longer, it's almost like it's hard to say how much it comes in at different moments because it's always kind of like a component of my brain Mm -hmm. but like it's not something i'm explicitly thinking about like all of the time Mm -hmm. you know and so it's hard to say when they're separate and when they're together because it's just there you know right but i know that we've like especially once we moved in together eventually worked out over a period of years like ground rules for like when (laughs) it's okay to like in for example like invoke somebody's birth chart versus like or like you're having X transit today versus yeah. where like we just need to talk about what we need to process right now and like the whatever relevant transit we're having is not necessarily um, like useful information mm. or or might be more of a distraction than dealing with like the, the thing at hand. Right. Mm. Yeah. I feel like it came up a lot more earlier. Mm. Um, yeah. I'm trying to think of wh- where to go with that. Um, 
I mean, I know that you were very against using birth chart placements in uh, in any sort of argument. Yeah, I think, I mean, I always took the position because uh, from that like aforementioned like difficult relationship where I've seen like negative applications of astrology where the person is like using the birth chart almost like as a weapon mm -hmm. to like attack or criticize or say, you are this way because of this placement wow. and you'll, right. ne you'll never change. Or um, I think this about this either placement or technique, whatever that preconception is, and that it's bad or, or negative or whatever. Mm -hmm. And so I was always, uh, I, I've sort of like worked it out that there's probably a point like in a relationship, especially if you're having difficulties where like invoking the chart is not good. And I could see, because for two astrologers, that's already can be challenging enough. But for two astrologers, you could probably find a way to work that out and achieve balance. I could see it becoming really unbalanced if an astrologer was doing that to a non-astrologer yeah. mm -hmm. and was like invoking birth chart placements and saying like you're this way because of this. Sure. That could be really not not helpful and, and counterproductive. Yeah, mm -hmm. definitely. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And I I think that we started bringing it up less later. I mean, both because, you know, you didn't <laughs> want us to do that, but also because we got to know each other longer and so it was almost like again, they're kind of like melded. We're like if we're having a fight about like you know, are being different from each other in a certain way and that being annoying to one or both of us. Mm -hmm. Like that's already, impl you know, the the placements that are associated with, it, with that are implicit at this point and not like things that we actually really have to talk right. about. Well, right. and one of the you things know? that changed is our approaches to astrology were radically different at the beginning. And yeah. that's a funny whole other separate mm -hmm. topic. I don't know where you guys were, where you started. Were you pretty similar or were you pretty different at the start of your... No, you're re really we're different? We're still really different. Well, I wouldn't, oh, okay. I, wouldn't, I wouldn't say we're really different. We're I'd say different. I'd say basically you are classically now whole sign. 100%. Okay. Not 100%. Which but... is great because obviously there's influence, you know, in regarding that. Yeah, sorry about that. <laughs> 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 no, but I'm open to it. You know, that's the whole point of learning from your partner, not just an astrologer, but you know, and the idea of let's say I, I learned from that porphyry sort of model. Mm -hmm. and I mean, that, so did I. And and then I went to learn about whole sign. And I remember the first time Eugenia proposed that to me. I thought, she really is an Aquarius, isn't she? She's <laughs> she's so rebellious. Right. <laughs> but what what I loved about it was that it really made me question again astrology, mm. which I thought was fantastic. You know, yeah. it was like and even astrologers um, who are far more experienced, let's say, or, or you know, got more years on it than me, when I've said to them, you know, are you using whole sign? And they go, no. So for me, actually, it made me think at first, this is interesting because people who place so much value in, you know, in, in this chart when it's always open to interpretation, you bring a new uh, system into it as well, and it can make people even more, you know, either questioning which i think is a great thing mm -hmm. you know the validity of the of the interpretation but actually i i do both that's what eugenia has given to me you know it's not it's not that i am i'm i'm all porphyry or i'm all whole sign i actually use both and can I explain what I, I gathered from that experience? Sure. So, yeah. <laughs> yes, please. Um, I love that we're already getting into house division because that's like <laughs> one of the tensest like debates sometimes in the astrological community historically for like two thousand years now. And that was actually one of the questions was somebody yeah. joked about. Can you have relationships across house, divi <laughs> house right. system division? <laughs> Which is a funny joke, but that actually comes up. Yeah, like it a, is yeah. challenging sometimes yeah. because I'm so adamant that all of his stuff is in the seventh, but on a porphyry perspective, it's all in the sixth because we're mm -hmm. at that last degree. Oh, right. So our charts are entirely different from one system to the next. Okay. So sometimes I am trying so, so much like, no, 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 come on, just see. see no, but you have said, sweetheart, yeah. you have said that I'm both. And we are both. Don't get me mm. wrong. I still have a lot of resonance with the porphyry or some of those other systems, but uh, I think it is a point of contention actually between us. Yeah, it's sometimes. it's a weird one. It's kind of like because my all my Sarge, which you know, I mean, she's very brave for, for going for that, aren't you, sweetheart? Very, yeah, very. Uh, going for a totally Sagittarius kind of like chart, mm -hmm. even though you've got quite a lot of Sagittarius as well. Let's be honest. Yeah. Um, but anyway, it would be in the sixth house mm -hmm. if it was porphyry, but in the, it's in the seventh um, if it's whole sign. Mm -hmm. And when you look at both, because for, for example, if it's whole sign, Uranus is in the sixth for me. So there's, there is a need to be healthy, um, to look at the more 
deeper aspects of health and healing or, or whatever. So that would make sense, you know, to have Uranus in the sixth of Scorpio. Whereas prior, he thought it was because of all of this being in his six. sixth. Right, mm-hmm. right. Sagittarius mm-hmm. stuff, which I've got, a, I've got a loaded sixth house of Sagittarius mm-hmm. stuff or seventh. Right. So, I mean, obviously, you, so you, you say what you think about the Porphyry and, and Holstein thing as well. Um, but just, just, just to kind of like, I got from it that she's pretty cool <laughs> in the sense that Eugenia is giving me an extra insight. And now whenever I look at charts for other people, for example, I look at both. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. And that's, I mean, that's a broader topic and a broader issue of just like what happens if you don't have the same approach to astrology Mm -hmm. and like house division is obviously one of the easiest areas where you could have that, that issue. But, you know, just because you're dating another astrologer, that's one of the things that that's actually one of the like be careful what you wish for type things <laughs> yeah. that that is like probably number one on the list <laughs> is there's people who you know probably are astrology enthusiasts or they've studied astrology for a while or even for years and maybe they've never been in a relationship with another astrologer and then someday they like meet that special person and they fall in <laughs> love and they like you know get together and go off on this magical relationship and then suddenly like they realize they radically disagree <laughs> or have like radically different systems mm-hmm. like technical approaches to mm-hmm. astrology which like to a normal person if you were trying to explain this to like a non-astrologer <laughs> they would be like yeah so what like right. it's just a minor difference <laughs> no, um, no. but no like astrology no. because astrologers pattern so much of their not just their worldview but also their view of themselves and their life and its significance and the lives of people around them around astrology uh, sometimes relatively minor technical changes or shifts can cause radical changes in how they understand their life. So people can mm-hmm. be very not not just defensive in a negative sense, but um, it, you know that can make a real big difference. And sometimes that can be like little minor things, like do you use um, like what orbs do you use? Like I use a ten <laughs> degree orb, or so this, this guy uses a six degree orb, or what have you. Let's say if there's a minor thing mm-hmm. like that. Right versus like a major thing like a tropical astrologer versus like a sidereal astrologer mm-hmm. or mm-hmm. you know house division like quadrant houses versus equal houses versus whole sign or sign rulerships traditional rulers mm-hmm. versus modern rulers mm-hmm. or even imagine meeting another astrologer and you do like western astrology and they do like vedic astrology mm-hmm. Yep. Mm-hmm. or you get a modern astrologer and a traditional astrologer i've heard hilarious anecdotes about um i guess i, I can't say your name but like a famous modern astrologer who dated a traditional astrologer and how they just like constantly got in arguments about stuff like that because that does and can really become a point of tension in the relationship if there's major differences between your approaches. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Right. I'd actually say we do have pretty different approaches too because uh, Tark, I, f- I feel, correct me if I'm wrong, is much more abstract. He's much more a felt astrologer, which mm-hmm. I absolutely admire because he really feels these transits in a almost like a a visceral way. Galactic center kind of way. <laughs> <laughs> yes, because his uh, he's got a lot at the galactic center. And I'm much more measured and statistical. So I've been over the course of 10 years keeping statistics and I've been measuring actually my cl- my clients um, against each other in their charts. And so I have all these very, for me, very clear data points that prove very clear um, indications of, of a multitude of things. And so I'm very strategic. I'm, I'm very heady. I'm very logical uh, because I come from the psychotherapy background also, and I'm working with clients. I don't use astrology in my life regularly at all. Uh, I don't. I rarely look at my own chart. I rarely look at transits. I'm I'm the person who goes back after the event. So because again, I I'm more. Uh, hesitant about where my brain will go if I see a certain transit coming. I don't want to spook myself out. Right. Mm-hmm. So I don't like I've I've in the past when I started learning astrology, I would look ahead to some of these transits and I'd get so I'd always look for the the scary bits. And I noticed it was taking me out of the present moment. So I stopped doing that for myself and I just I made a very strategic decision in my own life to use astrology to help the 
as a tool for my clients, that I would use it as a psychotherapist in the, in this way. Now I'm, I'm entirely an astrologer at this point. I'm not a psychotherapist any longer, technically. Like I don't see people weekly or anything like that. And so when I come out of work because I see so many clients, I don't really want to look at my chart. Mm. And I don't want to look at his either. I rarely look at his chart as mm-hmm. well. And I think that Tark is working with it more. So he's actually following transits and he's mm-hmm. following these things and he's he's almost embodying it and living it more than I am mm-hmm. um, because I'm looking at more as like a, a physical tool to use with other people to serve them and to help right. them. And I can't do that to myself. So I don't use it in that way for myself. And so I think that can actually sometimes be difficult for me because I don't want to look at my chart all the time and I don't want to talk about astrology all the time, actually. Mm-hmm. And I think... Tark is more prone to want to talk about it and look at it than I am. Mm-hmm. And sometimes, you know, just thinking about the challenges, I want to turn it off also sometimes. I don't want to think about astrology all the time. I really don't. Mm-hmm. Sometimes I just want to hang out, you mm-hmm. know, and just do other things yeah. in life. <laughs> yeah. <Right. Sure. laughs> and so sometimes, you know, I think we, I, for me, my perspective is that it's a tool amongst others. So, f- for example, our relationship is the the charts help to a point and then they just don't work anymore in terms of how can we get through this, say, argument. Mm-hmm. We can go to the chart up, up to a point and then we have to go deeper into like, well, what is your attachment style from your your youth as a psychotherapist? Mm. I want to know like more about the relationship with your family and how that's affecting our relationship now. And for that, you need lots of helpers not just you two and an, an astrology chart. You know, sometimes you need assistance through, you know, sometimes, you know, I buy seminars for us to listen to about how to communicate better to a man because <laughs> I clearly don't know how to do it very well. Or we go party instead. Or that, you know, or we'll just turn it off entirely. But right. it, it, I find that it's a part of my life, but it's not my life. Mm-hmm. Sure. And I understand how you could feel that way that you have different approaches in terms of how you apply it. But from a, a technical standpoint, it sounds like you guys probably started out much closer yeah. than you could have in like the worst case scenario in yeah. terms of like, we're not talking about like a, like a Chinese astrologer no. versus like a Vedic astrologer. You yeah. guys were met on the same forum for like evolutionary astrology. Evolutionary right? astrology. Yeah. yeah, I was yeah. trained by evolutionary astrology. We, we were definitely part of this union this cosmic kind of like you know intervention or however you want to describe it really Mm -hmm. because we're living proof of that if you if you see what i mean we both actively somehow in environments maybe that weren't suited to astrology learned about it Mm -hmm. but then also did what everybody else is doing i.e on the internet and then connected right and then suddenly there was a shared conversation Mm -hmm. and then application as well which i think is why it's really benefiting us making us more authentic and more i'm right in saying this aren't i yeah yeah you know more kind of deeper level of of astrology because it's, mm-hmm. it's it's good to to study it and to learn certain things but when you actually experience it and then and then actually live it mm-hmm. then it, you become i guess far more authentic and far more valuable and of service to others mm-hmm. would that be right yeah mm-hmm. well and just a quick point on mm-hmm. that Mm-hmm. I, before I met Tark, I was very single and <laughs> I was like never going to date again in the whole thing. And one of my mentors is this guy named Dr. John Demartini. I don't know if you know who he is, but he's one of my dearest mentors. And he said to me, just do what you love doing. And there's a good chance someone's going to show up who also loves that. Like you just have to show up in the world inspired. And then somebody, you know, you don't have to look for them, actually. Mm-hmm. Like, you shine your light, they, and it will, it'll be met. And I, and I, at the time, I wasn't really, like, certain about it. But I think there's a truth to anyone who's out there who is single and who maybe is wondering if they should date an astrologer, if they should be open to that. Part of my thought process is if you are inspired by something, whether it be astrology or horses or <laughs> baseball, there's a good chance that you're going to naturally just gravitate towards someone also because of your astrology chart for what you love. You'll send, tend to find that the person who you date is going to um, 
magnify that, sure. right? Because that's where mm-hmm. love comes from is these parts of our chart that we just love these things. Like his Jupiter's on my Mars and Venus, for mm-hmm. example. Okay. Mm-hmm. So we just like what I love is what he enjoys. Mm-hmm. Sure. Right? Right. Yeah. Um, I'm just thinking about like scenarios where that might not be the case or right. like at the start of our relationship, uh, we had very different approaches. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I mean, you were already a traditional astrologer, and I had just basically learned like modern Western. Um, yeah, you yeah. did like modern Western astrology, and I had Sorry. just gotten back from like living at a translation project for ancient texts, and right. like <laughs> it was talking about all this crazy stuff like zodiac releasing and whole sign houses and stuff like that. <laughs> yeah. Um, but then that was funny because it turned out there was like some weird overlap there that we realized in retrospect early on because I started paying attention to your zodiac releasing periods. And like every time we would meet up, um, you would hit like an arrow speak period. Right. And I was like, where is this going? <laughs> right, uh, right. <laughs> uh, because it started uh, turning into relationship much despite like despite not expecting that too, or not really looking for a relationship at the time. You definitely were not looking for a relationship at the right. time, very explicitly. Mm-hmm. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, but then you, I, I came back to Denver and started an astrology group and you attended the first meetings mm-hmm. and then we started hanging out afterwards and we went to UAC at the same time, which right. was in Denver that same month. Yeah, just a few weeks after we met. Right, so yeah. the United Astrology Conference, there was like a conference with like 2,000 astrologers in our city. Um, mm-hmm. Yeah, and then you asked to borrow my jacket, which uh, for some reason, which I, I thought was weird at the time. Uh, <laughs> so later, I, I went home and asked Patrick a horary question, and I was like, "Is this going to be a relate? Will Lisa and I have a relationship?" And he looked at the chart, and he's like, "Yeah, like the significators are applying, right? Um, you know, because if you asked to borrow somebody's jacket, it's getting pretty serious." <laughs> that. He took that very seriously, yeah, right? Point. right. Drop that bomb, yeah. yeah, yeah. <laughs> It's time to get the horror involved <laughs> at that stage. Um, so that's one of the funny, though, anecdotes that sometimes happens. Like as astrologists, you can have things like a horary chart, or you can be right. seeing somebody's transits go crazy in like the relationship sectors when you've just met somebody mm-hmm. and realize that this might be something more significant than it seems just on first appearance. Right, right. Yeah. And then, I mean, you had the advantage of some of that being kind of more like tested for you versus at the time, since I'd only known like modern Western astrology up to that point, I was like, I'm just having crazy Uranus transits. And like, this might just be like a three week fling or something, you know, like I wasn't really pinning anything on like it lasting necessarily Mm -hmm. because that was what I was seeing astrologically. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, neither of us were um, and then, but also to go back to the topic of like different approaches, like we had radically different approaches and yeah. like different lifestyles. And so that in and of itself, like the fact that we were so different in our approaches astrologically was like one of the factors we were both like marking against us of this everlasting right. mm. because like I used traditional rulerships and used modern rulerships. I used whole sign houses and you used whatever you're using like <laughs> placidus placidus of course yeah. okay. you know whatever <laughs> whatever uh used placidus um yeah and i was using zodiac releasing and stuff mm-hmm. and you were very unimpressed with that technique i think at first uh annual perfections i was unimpressed with at first okay yeah well because <laughs> I, I read your chart at some point early on before it was even romantic and it wasn't a consultation no. or anything it was just an impromptu thing and made some statements and I've probably mentioned this a bunch of times on the podcast already, but you were just like incredibly unimpressed because a lot of the statements that I made, you were just like, no, that's wrong. And it, and then over the past 10 years, I've been vindicated because like almost every single one of those statements has come true, but yeah. it didn't happen until like later in her life. Right. Um, so to be fair, <laughs> it was not fair. correct yet. Yes. Yes. <laughs> in, in a broader, like four dimensional view of time, <laughs> everything, everything's happening at once. Exactly. And sure. Technically, I was I was already correct. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> but I mean, I think, you know, it's been interesting that I have then adopted a lot of those things for my own practice because it could seem on the face of it as though like I just kind of like did what you wanted, you know, where which isn't true at all. Like I was very actually quite stubborn um, yeah, I mean, <laughs> for a while. Well, that's a really valid, that's a real question is our approaches actually did end up gravitating towards each other and yeah. we ended up you ended up following and developing approach that's very similar to my own in terms of both natal astrology and electional and using zodiac releasing. And in some of those techniques, you've become 
next to myself. Like I don't know anybody else that can use Zodiac releasing as effectively. Um, I don't know anyone else in the world besides like you know maybe my friend Patrick Watson who's been studying it for about as long as I have. And so you've become really good with all of those techniques. And our approaches are now very similar and have converged. But I wonder what it would have been like, and if it would have lasted as long, if we just continued to have completely different approaches mm -hmm. and never really saw eye to eye, to eye on some of those things. Right, yeah. right. And I think that's part of like what I was kind of getting at earlier with the dialogue, the constant dialogue, because that didn't come through me just going, "Okay, you're right." You know, mm -hmm. like certainly <laughs> pretty mm -hmm. much the opposite. Mm -hmm. um, but it came through like actual constant dialogue about these things and of like learning more about the techniques than you yeah. learned initially or learning to see how they were applied or something like that yeah exactly i mean in learning to use them myself and then kind of verifying them for myself rather than just taking someone else's word mm -hmm. even if it's someone i'm in a relationship with right um and conversely there were a f i mean fewer things i would say but there were some things where um i would kind of stick to my guns and be like, no, I'm really seeing this as a thing. And it was more of a modern thing. And mm. you're like, I don't see that, you know, like why would mm. conceptually, why would that be true traditionally? I'm like, I don't know, but I keep seeing it. And this seems to be re a real thing. Right. And there were f a few things like that, that I feel like you were influenced on as well over time. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. And that was it then. It was sold <laughs> and sealed. Great. Well, I mean, I think so much of it is like how you know how big of a part of your life is astrology right. and like how important is it for you as an individual for any individual to share that with someone and that's going to be different for everyone and you know for you that's like your whole life you know it's both your profession and your worldview and it became mine as well yeah i mean i would have a really hard time i think being in a relationship with somebody that wasn't an astrologer because i mm -hmm. spend i've dedicated like my life to mm -hmm. it since i was really young since i was 14 or 15 and I just knew that that's what I wanted to do with my life and I wanted to single-mindedly throw everything I had at it um it would be hard I think for to be in a relationship with somebody that that couldn't connect on that level because they wouldn't understand why I was spending so much time doing this or yeah. what have you versus I could see other people if astrology is more of a hobby or if it's something mm -hmm. that you have kind of like a passing interest in or mm -hmm. something like that but it's not your main thing or it's not even your profession necessarily that may not be like a deal breaker for you. Right, mm -hmm. right. Yeah, and for me, it was mostly the worldview thing. Like mm -hmm. before it was a profession for me, um, you know, I'd been studying it some, but I wasn't really practicing a lot by that point. Um, mm -hmm. And, but I had always been interested in things like that. Mm -hmm. And so it didn't necessarily have to be astrology, but I think I would always have a hard time being with anyone who wasn't interested in things like yeah. this. So for instance, you know, I was in a um, religious studies grad program before I dropped out and just focused on astrology. I lived in Buddhist meditation centers. So it would always have to be something around this, I think, mm -hmm. for me, even. And the person, like, I, could, I don't think I could be in a relationship with someone who was, like, actively, like, antagonistic at all, yeah. Um, yeah. at least open to it, if nothing mm -hmm. else. But certainly being able to share all of it has been great, you know. Mm -hmm. But I think that's probably not for everyone. Like, that might be too much astrology for some people. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, it depends on how much you want to leave astrology at the door. I mean, it yeah. sounds like, Eugenia, that that's sort of something that's important to you, that because you see so many clients, for example, in your... Mm -hmm spending so much time processing with people and going through their charts and talking about their life stories and stuff that sometimes you, you really do want to leave that yeah. at the door when you come home. Yeah. Yeah. I know. I think Tark spends a lot more time engaged in astrology, whether it's reading or watching, listening, thinking than I do. Uh, but I, I'm with you. I, I, I think I at this point it would be almost impossible to be with someone who does is not an astrologer. I'm I'm kind of of the same thought process as as both of you, uh, because whether he's spending more time with it or not, it, it doesn't matter. I love that that's what he's doing with his time. Sure. So if he was watching football games, I could be down with it, I guess. But I'm much more. What about basketball? Okay, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but I like that that's where he's spending his time. Mm -hmm. it, it it seems like a good value of time to me. Whereas your relationship before, she didn't see the value in him learning this information. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. What a, so your prior, is this your first astrological relationship, Turk? Yeah. Okay. Um, this is the first uh, relationship I've had with an astrologer for sure, yeah. Okay. Yeah, there's been... 
relationship before um interest in astrology or holistic health but mm -hmm. not like an actual in-depth you know okay. understanding and like you know with, with with eugenia um when we met i never expected eugenia to have an interest in me you know i just never expected that it wasn't like when we were chatting i, I thought i just never expected the fact that it could develop into a relationship simply because I kind of looked up to her, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. you know, from, from, you know, I was, astrology came to me through, um, it comes to some people. Right. And they might not know that they have the ability in it until they, around other people, start reading charts, for example, um, or they get validated because they're so in tune with it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So that, for the, for maybe for the reasons why I got into astrology, I was kind of like a bit of an outcast, really, how it came to me. So the fact that I was communicating maybe authentically um, with yourself and you valued that, mm -hmm. I never really thought that that would have been <clears throat> turned into a relationship, if you see what I mean. Mm -hmm. So when we first started talking, you know, you were talking more intellectually together. Right. Mm -hmm. And it became a kind of like a uh, intellectual debate on who's what's right, what's not. But yet there was a found respect through that. If I noticed with our relationship a little bit, when I started saying stuff to you, because of the nature of your style, you kind of just sat back and listened a bit. Mm -hmm. If you remember, we've talked about this. Yeah. And for me, that was really putting me out of my depth completely because it's like, I've got to overcompensate now and, and say more than maybe I should have done. Mm. But Eugenie was obviously letting me maybe become more confident. So she was really encouraging me in, in a lot of ways. Mm -hmm. And then at the same time, when it came down to maybe me doing that for you, mm -hmm. suddenly you're like, oh, right, yeah, he does know his stuff, actually. <laughs> well, that's what I was going to say. Yes, maybe I was letting you gain confidence, and that might have been it, but actually I thought what you said was interesting, <laughs> right? Mm -hmm. I think right. you're a really interesting human, right? Okay. Like, I like listening to you. I think your thoughts are really weird and bizarre and and um, altering for my life. And I think, again, because his approach is so unintellectual, uh, it's so abstract that individuals like maybe myself and more like you two as well, perhaps, uh, you know, if I don't, I need to see it to believe it. I'm one of these people for sure. And he's not, well, no. Yeah. I can't well, argue. Well, we, 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 compl but... we complement each other in the fact that you're more like sort of logical, yeah. analytical, as I'm a bit more creative, yeah. um, philosophical. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Sure. And that's, that's where the chemistry is in terms of our, dynamic mm -hmm. yeah so i learn a lot like he he tells me things that I, i've not heard from any other astrologer before mm -hmm. and because maybe you've come up with it originally you don't recognize that it's actually really remarkably interesting and so I've, i gave you the space to actually massage out those words and then now i've been able to integrate them into my my life and my practice absolutely i mean i now he's taught me I mean, we've taught each other equally at this point. I don't think either of us would be considered more learned than the other mm -hmm. at this point. I mean, and, and I don't think an, originally that was the case either, actually. So it's sort of like, again, it, it, to <coughs> excuse me, it totally illustrates the point how we've, as two astrologers, have been growing together in yeah. partnership. Mm -hmm. Exactly. Yeah. It um, really does that. And that's a really crucial, like, broader topic that it's again one of those things that people probably don't anticipate when they get in a relationship with another astrologer is there being um disparities like sometimes like a learning disparity if one person's been studying it yeah. longer than the other there can be disparities if like uh one person's like a professional astrologer and the other person's not necessarily or has a different profession mm -hmm. um there can we've already talked about the technical disparity there can also be like even if they're both professional astrologers, there can be disparities in terms of like maybe one has been gotten luckier, has been more successful in their career so far, or the other one hasn't yet. Um, there's all sorts of weird disparities that you can run into, and sometimes you can start off at very different places and then have to like sort of meet somewhere in the middle over time, mm -hmm. but which in the long term kind of is fine and works out as long as you're sort of in it for the long game. But right. in terms of the short term, sometimes those disparities can be too difficult to get through and can sometimes lead to the end of the relationship if they're not resolvable in a short 
mm. sort of time frame? Yeah, I think so too. And I think we've had some of that certainly over time. Um, yeah, I mean, I've become like a full-time practicing astrologer compared to like not in the beginning and things like that, whereas mm -hmm. you were already pretty much doing this. I mean, I was on my way, but I yeah, started you were a day on. job yeah. when we met and then I called you one day like a year into our relationship and said yeah. I'm quitting my day job right. to do astrology full-time. Yeah. And then that first like year or two, we were both struggling financially because yeah. I'm like trying to make it as an astrologer. Yeah. And yeah, we joked in the last episode about how that summer we would like go to the store and like debate like one of us buying the spaghetti noodles and one of us buying the sauce and like yeah. that being like a major discussion. Did you about... use the electional astrology? <laughs> those no. no, that would no. have been a good idea now that I think about it. But yeah, I mean we were we were that broke at, at the beginning. So I mean, obviously, both of us valued, you know, all of the astrology and that being like a pursuit. Whereas I could see someone else maybe being like, "Yeah, I don't want to live my life this broke," you know, mm -hmm. and like pinning everything on that. Right. Because um, you or... told me that right when we were moving in together, you're like that you were quitting your other job. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Like we're, so, we're like I, yeah. In and I was like, okay. Happened I guess. to be quitting my job. <laughs> right. Rock and roll, Chris. Rock and roll. <laughs> yeah. Exactly. <laughs> Just murmured that under my breath. Like, <laughs> um, yeah, because I could see that because I've seen other astrologers that have like a non astrologer partner and they want to quit their day job and pursue astrology full time. And I can see how that would look weird from the partner's perspective again mm -hmm. or cause like major tensions if you don't necessarily believe in what they're yeah. doing on a real practical mm -hmm. level or even a philosophical yeah. level. Mm -hmm. um, that's going to make it harder to be supportive. During the the difficult times, mm -hmm. yeah, and also just knowing that it might be a harder profession to kind of like make a full time living yeah. in, you mm -hmm. know, for a lot of people, yeah. um, you know, like asking yourself, like, am I willing to do that in my partnership? Am I because this will impinge on my own life, you mm -hmm. know, and the, like what is possible for us financially and things like that? Yeah, because yeah, it's not. Uh, again, like surprise to skeptics, it's not a career <laughs> field that people get into because they want to make money. Right. They get into it because they actually believe it's a legitimate phenomenon and they want to um, pursue it and and spend as much time doing it and exploring it in a in a fashion as they can. And mm -hmm. doing it professionally is one of the best ways to study astrology because then you're literally working with people one on one with their charts, mm -hmm. you know, whether that's a natal or electional or what have you, mm -hmm. and that's a large part of the reason why people pursue it as a career because they can't see themselves doing anything else. Right, right. Mm -hmm. Well, and it's funny how you know well things have gone eventually. I feel like for your career with mm -hmm. this, I remember actually like my dad saying something skeptical to you when you first met my parents of like, so that seems like one of those uh, fields where you know you might not be able to. I forget exactly how he phrased it, but basically you're not going to get rich doing this. Mm -hmm. And you were like, mm, yeah, maybe. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> it was like really early on. Okay. <laughs> yeah, I've successfully blocked that. <laughs> Out of yeah. My yeah, and I mean, he wasn't mean about it, but he was just like a little bit, you know, like concerned for his daughter sure. kind of thing, you know. Yeah. Um, like, are you going to be able to make a living at this? Right. Yeah, yeah. and that was very early on. In fact, in your, you know, making a living at it. So. I mean, that was a that's a whole facet of this. I haven't even thought about it, but that would be rough if your extended family, mm. you know, was not okay with astrology or was yeah. skeptical yeah. of. Yeah something or are not supportive that would be difficult as well i think we've both mm -hmm. lucked out in that our families have been relatively supportive of our careers as astrologers definitely mm -hmm. yeah i think that's a good point yeah. I, th I think it's a great point that you're mentioning there because that lack of awareness of, of how you could have a career in astrology for example mm -hmm. and as you were saying lisa then it's like you know when especially if two couple you know, two astrologers together in the same boat, bringing up kids, let's say. Mm, right. Yeah. Um, and then there's all that pressure, parental potentially, or even others. And that's going to have an impact potentially on people making decisions even, I suppose. But that, that's not necessarily to do with the astrologers themselves. That's more the, what goes with relationship really, I suppose. Right. Sure. I mean, yeah, a lot yeah. of these things are can be extended further mm -hmm. into mm -hmm. like two people being in the same profession, any profession, for yeah. instance, or, you yeah. know, just like two people having slightly different values about anything in life, yeah. you know, and like how important that is to each of those individuals mm. and yeah. whether that's a deal breaker or not a deal breaker, yeah. you know? So, I mean, a lot of this, of course, goes beyond astrology. Yeah, right? sure, um, sure. But yeah. I think it's a really interesting point, you know, in terms of career and supporting people in career in this profession mm -hmm. and having that shared interest of understanding why it's benefit and why the urgency to do it or mm -hmm. the need to do it. Right. Mm -hmm. I think if you're with another astrologer or someone who understands that, 
Mm -hmm. straight away you're in a better position aren't you yeah and it's a weird field it really is mm -hmm. i mean it's unusual and you know most people are looking at more world i i feel like you know the it's either in the metaphysical field or in the sort of like quasi spiritual field and most people just as a population are not going to be building their lives around that right you know true and so it's always going to be a smaller pool if you're wanting to have yeah. that same thing true I think. right well and that's why though sometimes when another when you find a relationship with another astrologer and there's something that brought you together whether it's like a tra mutual attraction or circumstance or what have you sometimes that can actually create an interesting pressure on the relationship itself mm -hmm. because it's so rare sometimes that you do connect with another astrologer that sometimes it can make you um, maybe even make greater concessions than you would mm -hmm. otherwise to Absolutely. in order to keep the relationship because you know how rare it is or how totally. um, you know not common it is to even just like find somebody you get along with on that level who shares that same interest. Mm -hmm. True. Yeah. So true. I think it's important if you have that responsibility as an astrologer that you can look at a chart. And then if you're trying to make it fit, which is, I suppose, is the biggest problem with all interpretation, trying to make things fit because you can see, well, this could happen, that could happen, and you're starting to see more than maybe just the obvious, what needs to get sorted at the time. Mm -hmm. And that could be a real issue with two astrologers because they're talking astrology rather than just basic living mm -hmm. together. So, right. the, so it's, it's a blessing and it's a curse. It can be. Right. Mm -hmm. Right. If you don't discern accordingly and recognize that you know, life's life without astrology and yet having astrology can be really helpful. Right. Yeah. And, and that's the the crucial balance that mm -hmm. is probably the most important thing. I think every ast astrologer couple has to learn is what is the balance between incorporating astrology versus not. Yeah. Um, have you guys been, because you've been together for about two years now? Yeah. Has that, is that something that you've found that you've learned and grown more accustomed to or was that initially was there like a disparity early on in your relationship where you were doing more astrology than you are now i think i think um we were communicating weren't we before we met very yeah. much in relation to astrology we're getting to know each other as well weren't we yeah right because you guys had the long distance thing which is a whole element mm -hmm. in and yes. of itself of yeah. the idea that you have in your head like yeah. of who somebody is yes. and then the reality when you actually meet up in person yeah, and exactly. start spending like an extended amount of time together and yeah, that's a whole other layer because mm -hmm. we talked for like regularly for at least we, we six were months we were addicted to each other let's be we honest still are. <laughs> right. you know let's be honest on, it was an online kind of fascination you yeah. know which resulted in a lot of communication on the internet yeah a lot and it wasn't just astrology it was poetry it was it was just basic chit chat wasn't but it but it was also old school courting you know yeah. that was the cool yeah. part there was a romantic before aspect, we yeah. ever even like held hands mm. we knew a lot about each other mm. which i really appreciate actually i think i was i think that's like a really good way to get to know someone mm. uh but yeah i think and then we met yeah which was pretty intense and great. <laughs> yeah, did you did amazing. you guys how did you how did the timing work? Did you elect the timing at all? <laughs> like cuz that's something that I've seen and I've done like I, <laughs> yeah. Uh, but did you um I don't know, did you pay attention to the timing at all? Yeah. We we did didn't we because remember when we first met we were talking about those retrogrades and the eclipse and everything. And I think but not so much electional though. I was doing a little oh, electional were, without right. letting him know. So, oh, right. so you, you guys timed it to meet up under the Great American Eclipse in Leo? Mm -hmm. Right, but he flew in before that, yeah. and I okay. had elected the day without him knowing and the the time. Okay. Mm -hmm. So I wanted him coming in on like a Taurus uh, rising type of – I, I can't remember the details, but mm -hmm. I did have that in mind. And even – when he just flew here, I, I'm always, it's always in the back of my head. And of course life gets in the way and you just can't do it sometimes, but it's always somewhere in my head uh, right. for our meeting dates and times. But I got to say, it doesn't, it doesn't, it so far hasn't mattered much uh, just because the relationship it, um, can be much bigger than that at those moments of seeing each other for the first time that in a few weeks or months or whatever, however long it had sure. been. Uh, but yeah, I think that 
because we haven't uh, been able to, we have lived together and we've spent a lot of time together, but we haven't like lived in one house together yeah. and, and paid actually, the bills. And I love this part. This is the, like the most sad yeah, thing ever. ever. You guys yeah. have just been like traveling the country over the past or the world over the, world. Like, the past yeah. year, year or yeah. something, right? Yeah. <laughs> And those retrogrades, really, we got to learn about those retrogrades last year, Venus yeah. and, and, and um, yeah. Mars, wasn't it? Yeah. We really got to learn about that, how it affected us both. And I just wanted to say another thing about, you know, um, using astrology. Yeah. You know, um, you know, with with the elections or, any, or anything like that, when it actually came to it and we were actually in each other's energy and then suddenly the astrology kind of goes out the window a little bit mm -hmm. because you're just facing each other's personalities and mm -hmm. you know that's the real meat and potatoes yeah. you know you know and and it was lucky that we had the chance to get to know each other away from each other because mm -hmm. that that romantic traditional aspect came into being yeah and then when there were certain transits that happened and put pressure on the relationship we, we were aware of that to deal with it mm -hmm. but when it comes down to it it still comes down to the the birds and the bees, <laughs> right. security, yeah, um, trust, yeah, and can you find those things in the chart? Well, we get indications, but spending time with somebody and actually being with that person is really the key, isn't it? You know, it sounds right. really obvious, but for us, it wasn't so easy for that to happen, was it? Mm -hmm. Just being in the same location, if you see what I mean, mm -hmm. right? Right. But it is true. It's like it's amazing with all of our sag how <laughs> it's just made us more sag. Honestly, it's it's a bit nuts. Um, it, you know, I think we get into relationships with humans, and the great thing about relationship astrology is we can kind of see how we might trigger one another or exaggerate a certain personality trait. Right? Yeah. I mean, mm -hmm. how many of your assumptions going into the relationship about like your sinistry or how that was going to work out, how many of them were like, were there some that were notably like correct? And you're like, oh yeah, this worked out pretty much how I expected versus were there ones where there was like a bit of a curveball or something you didn't expect? I think it's more curveball than expected, actually. Okay. I think some of the things we thought would be really positive are actually much more challenging. Mm. Uh, mm. You see, I, I see that as, as interpretation, as how we look at a chart, positive, negative, challenge, ease. And I think there was aspects that I thought about our chart, our synastry, our composite, mm -hmm. that was going to be look one way, and then the reality was different. However, when we worked out why that was happening, mm -hmm. you know, the Uran Uranus aspects, basically. Yeah, we have some Uranus aspects. And then we okay. realized that that could take it to a higher level or it could take it to a much more crisis level. Mm -hmm. So again, it comes down to that, what astrology is, it's interpretation. It could be positive, negative, challenge, or difficulty. Sure. I mean, have you guys ever had though any like really rough transits like that that coincided with like a notable like blow blowout or something like that? Oh, well, those eclipses at the start of the year. Okay, uh, that was that was a challenge. The Mars wasn't retrograde. It? The retrograde okay. when uh, we were in Egypt. Uh, the Venus retrograde when we were traveling America. I mean, yeah, it's and because we have the same chart, it's very potent, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. So. Uh, I mean, one of the questions is, does that help though? Because I think one of the things yes. that was surprising to me is that the answer is not always as much as you think it is. Like knowing yeah. the transits mm -hmm. doesn't always remove the issue or doesn't yep. mean you can right. solve the issue. The issue is just there and the astrology happens to be reflecting it. Mm -hmm. Right. And you can both be like, well, that's great, but yeah. now we still have to work out <laughs> the issue. Deal. And that's right. exactly. I actually think that the knowing the transits has saved our asses on many occasions because mm. it helps us as at least recognize that totally. this is happening. This is for a reason. There's mm. a reason we're, we're triggering each other this way, or there's a reason this is being activated in us right mm -hmm. now, mm -hmm. but it doesn't help us actually deal with it. Mm -hmm. Right. right? Like because it's not like a magic wand. No. Like you still have to solve it. You're you just more like you're exactly. just identifying the problem. Exactly. Which is yeah. the same issue, honestly, that you run into with clients is that occasionally you'll have somebody that, that wants to be a client or comes to you as a client who thinks that astrology is just like magic and it's going to mm -hmm. solve all their problems. But oftentimes what you're doing is 
sometimes describing them or telling them things about their life up till now or about their present that they already kind of know mm -hmm. <laughs> just because the astrology is just reflecting that. And right. that's not necessarily inherently as like magically useful as, as some people might assume. Mm -hmm. Right. Right. Yeah, it's like it's it's still something to be like, wow, this matches the energy of the moment mm -hmm. in some way, whether it's that's, you know, um, just current transits in the world or current transits mm -hmm. to each other's charts or things like that. Um, mm. But yeah, you still have to do something about it. Right. Well, and I work exactly. with uh, psychotherapists like all over the country, so I co-treat with clients. So I always, I always, when I see a client, I encourage them to seek further therapies based on my assessment of their chart uh, based on just the, the different psychological practices that exist. And one of my therapists I work with most frequently, she calls me the validation therapy. Mm. So somebody's going through a very difficult time. She says, go see Eugenia and you will actually learn that th there's a reason this is happening. And sometimes that's all you need from astrology. Oh, there's a reason. Like, mm. I mean, I've, I've had clients come to me who have just lived through like those those experiences where you just don't you don't even want to hear about it because it's so tragic to even know someone has had to go through these experiences mm -hmm. and they'll come see me oftentimes through a, a therapist referral and i'll say well yeah <laughs> let's let's take a real good look at this transit mm -hmm. or this mm -hmm. progression or whatever it might be this is actually, I, I promise you at some point, you're going to recognize why this is happening. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. you'll somewhere find an ounce of gratitude for it, that the heavens above are are guiding you, that they, you know, they're for you, they're with you. And uh, um, so, yeah, so I think of it as validation therapy, astrology, and mm -hmm. a lot of, but yeah, it doesn't actually give us like it won't like come in and mediate a fight. Yeah, yeah. Well, and I know that we've talked about that issue, right? I didn't know if you wanted to. What part? Just the, you know, if the astrology is correlating with like a certain conflict or something like that, how much do you put it on the astrology of the moment versus like, no, this is really a thing that I'm mad at you right. about, you know? <laughs> yeah, we have, we have debates yeah. about that. Like if one of us is having like a Mars transit and happens to be like particularly irritable that day and it sparks an argument, like how much is the astrology just like um, reflecting that like you didn't get enough sleep that night and you're more irritable mm -hmm. and that's it. You just need to like get through that period versus how much um, is it more causal? How much is it like you're having this transit and that's part of maybe not the only reason, but a contributing cause to irritability in some sense so that we need to be more cognizant. We need to be actively more cognizant of the astrology because it's somehow causing these things to happen versus it just correlating with it and therefore it not being if it's not a cause, then it's not the primary thing we need to address. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, and I think that you know, there's there's good arguments for both sides, yeah. and probably it's different proportions in any different circumstance. Mm -hmm. You know, because like sometimes it really is just like no, either one of us or both of us is going to be feeling a certain way more than usual in this moment because that's the astrology of this mm -hmm. moment, and mm -hmm. that's actually helped me a lot. I feel like, um, and that's kind of why I go to that side sometimes because, for instance, say there's like. A transiting, you know, moon square Saturn, just just in mm. the transits themselves, not to our charts or anything. And like, if I didn't know that astrologically, mm. I would be like, "Why are you not connecting with me yeah. right now?" You know, yeah. like I would blame you more probably, or you, anyone, you know. Mm -hmm. And I, since I know the astrology of any given moment, not really trying to obsess about it, but just because I usually do, okay. you know, know what's going on, then I am just like, okay, that's what the moment is right now, you know. And I think that actually like takes away from like fights that could happen you yeah. know i mean i and i definitely agree with that i can see that there's also a flip side which mm -hmm. um is and sometimes I, i've seen it come up in other people's relationships but sometimes uh blaming the transits for something rather than addressing the yes. underlying right. like actual issue and right. that's yeah. the danger that i worry about with a more causal approach to astrology is that sometimes it might lead you more to focus too much on the astrology mm -hmm. rather than mm -hmm. like whatever the issue is at hand. Right. Absolutely. And like think you don't actually have to work out the specific issue between mm -hmm. you as individuals because you can put it off on the astrology. Right. Totally. Yeah. Totally. Whether right. that's like in your charts or, or otherwise. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. That's one of I think probably one of the most like te like you're on the edge with that one all the time. Mm -hmm. 
you know. Mm. Yeah, but in your chart. Yeah, I think, like I say, if yeah. you ch try to make things fit or you're overcompensating by the knowledge that one may have rather than dealing with the, the issue, which is the opportunity in relationships to expand or not. Mm. I think all of that um, is the danger, you know, mm -hmm. of, of dating an astrologer in the sense mm -hmm. that um, it, it could be very commonsensical, you know, you're in a relationship with somebody, something happens and you just have a, a fight or you make love or do whatever, you know, to get over that, whatever it is that you've just, it's just happened. But if you start intellectualizing it, mm -hmm. yeah, there's a real danger because you're not you're going to keep coming up with that problem again and again. And there's sure. also when potentially you, mm -hmm. when you know mm -hmm. things are coming like a Mars retrograde, it's it really for it, it puts everything a bit more on edge than for couples who don't know that's happening right now because you're aware oh, there's a, a, a Venus retrograde right now mm -hmm. or a Mercury retrograde mm -hmm. or an eclipse. And so that's one of the reasons I try not to look at transits, I, which is impossible because this is what I do for a living. But because I'm a big believer of like co-creating our reality, mm -hmm. right? And I, I don't necessarily believe that we have free will. I kind of think <laughs> based on what we've learned as astrologers and just watching people's charts all day long, I think there's a, a plan, some magic, divine, godlike plan. I don't know how, or I, that's the faith in astrology. Some Something put this together. Mm -hmm. And whatever put this together was a brilliant, brilliant architect of reality. But I also believe in our co-creation with the gods above, with our experience. And because I'm a big fan of neurology and neuroscience i know how the brain works and when we put ideas into the brain our brain starts to believe it also and so there are there are elements so for example one of the examples i use just with clients is and when our parents say to a child you are ugly you are ugly the brain starts to believe that mm -hmm. right and it's not true right it we get to actually believe what we want and so when I look at transits, especially in the relationship, how much of it is me assuming we're going to have that challenge because of that transit sure. versus, you know, like, like, like Tark saying, maybe people who don't understand astrology, they just kind of like have a, a tiff when Mars is like on their sun that day and they just laugh through it and just like make their way through it. Whereas an astrologer couple says, you have Mars on your sun right now. Like you're really activating me and I can feel your energy. And, mm. and I think that that is the constant walk of the blessing and the curse of understanding this information for mm. our personal lives. And then exponentially with our partners who also understand astrology is how much do we place our energy towards trying to figure out what this is going to look like versus mm -hmm. just being in the moment. Yeah. Sure. Right. Yeah. And yeah. It, yeah. That's definitely like a core issue, I think. Core Cause, issue. Because you bring up, yeah, and the, and the underlying issue there is the danger of creating the situation that you think you're seeing in the astrology or the person, um, yeah, just like accidentally creating something because they're paying attention to the astrology too mm -hmm. much, and let's yeah. say. Mm -hmm. I'm trying to think of the keyword for that. There's some specific uh, so, like self fulfilling prophecy. Yeah, exactly. self fulfilling yeah. prophecy, yeah. but right. like instead like doing it in your relationship. Mm -hmm. Right. Um, and mm -hmm. that's something you definitely want to avoid. And that's sometimes a good reason not to look at the astrology, yeah. but instead to just do the relationship. Right. Well, I mean, I think also one of the things that if you're in a relationship using astrology, whether it's one of you or both of you over a long enough period of time, you see that you can still actually be surprised oh, by how no. things turn out, Absolutely. even if you can see all the symbolism and generally understand all the symbolism. And so that's, I think, been interesting to me over time, because I think I worried more with mm -hmm. the astrology before, mm -hmm. you know, yeah. like in earlier years. And you know, I can't say I never worry about things now, but it's just more like I've seen enough instances at this point, you know, in either of our or both of our charts where it's like, oh, I thought that was going to go a certain way, but it went slightly different than that. Mm -hmm. And, you know, and after, you know, a period of time of seeing that, it's like, okay, well, you don't need to obsess about the astrology. Yeah. yeah. I just wanted to say as a bit of an example, um, when we were thinking about a significant date, I mean, we definitely should have come to you two, by the yeah. way. Just heads up there, everyone. That's true. Yeah, yeah. we made a big mistake disagree. there. Yeah. Um, but we were just trying our best to kind of like come up with a date. And then 
that turned into a bit of a nightmare for oh, us. Oh, it too. really, oh yeah, really did. Disagreeing it, about, elec- about election electional <laughs> dates or like oh, right. transits or like when yeah. to do or initiate, yeah. especially yeah. for big okay. commitments. That's so, a yeah. great one. It yeah, yeah. really like messed yeah. us up. We yeah. haven't dealt with this yet, but one <laughs> I could imagine would be a nightmare, and I've seen in other astrological couples. Although it wasn't that bad in those instances, but I could see it being is like picking a marriage date. Yeah, picking like, a wedding date for yeah. yourself. Yeah, or an electional, yeah. especially if you had different approaches. Like if you're using yeah, that different, would be... different house systems or different rulerships or sidereal versus tropical, right. and then you've got to try to pick a date. Yeah, that would be rough. No, that would be obnoxious. Yeah, I'm glad that we don't have different electional approaches. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, yeah. uh, or so, that's. So, so going to a third party, for example, astrologer or whatever, is useful for any couple, mm-hmm. you know, because yeah. you can try and work things out yourself. You, you know, you, you, could, you could have a master's, let's say, psychotherapy, whatever. I have a master's in, in this and we get together. We think we've got it all worked out. But emotions and all these sorts of things and different perspectives can, can really become, you know, make one quite retarded, really, in terms of making obvious decisions. Yeah. And we we definitely came across that yeah. at one time, like a perception of of Neptune or, or, or Pisces yeah. and Venus. Your perception from my perception was very different. And then we, what we ended up doing is learning about the differences mm-hmm. of those, um, you know, interpreting those symbols and and those uh, ideas. Right. But then time goes by. Yeah. Right. So that that's a danger, you know, with um, two huge. two astrologers who might have who might be. You know, one might be more interested in the grounded aspects of astrology, like you know, let's say Capricorn or Virgo. The other person might be a bit more mm-hmm. romantic orientated, a bit more interested in Pisces and mm-hmm. Sag. Right. If you see what I mean. Yeah, mm-hmm. definitely. Not mm-hmm. just your own like interpretations in general, but how mm-hmm. your own chart even might color what you're drawn to or how you interpret certain things and the in conflict. astrology. And then the conflict of choosing a date, like such an important one on right. those conflicts is very challenging. Right. And just as a side note, we were actually at my cousin's wedding last fall and they couldn't have picked a better date. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And, and they, they had no try. idea. Yeah, that happens. No one so Venus at the midheaven. Like yeah. it was like yeah, yeah. perfection. Right. No idea. Yeah, that happens sometimes <laughs> without <laughs> yeah. intentional election. Because love, <laughs> love, just love, like, no. love the universe, <laughs> synchronicity, just common sense will provide the answers. Mm-hmm. And that's sometimes where it becomes detrimental. Mm-hmm. It shouldn't be. Sure. But emotions and um, perspectives and, and also conditioning from the past of experiences yeah. may skew a very obvious common sense decision. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Right. Sure. <laughs> yeah. That's definitely a big, I mean, that's just an issue in general in terms of like when to try to use astrology to control or like manipulate the outcome of things of the future versus when to just let nature take its course. Yeah. And that's mm-hmm. one of the core hardest probably long-standing debates in astrology in general probably subtly because that's just tied back into like the whole fate free will thing yep, right. but that's a perfect other example of a manifestation of it mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah. yeah well and you can see i mean this is kind of just a side note but you can see in this entire like meta discussion of like this this whole enterprise is not for everyone no. you know <laughs> and so like even talking about these things or worrying about these things or like most people in their day-to-day life don't want to be like contemplating fate and free will about right. like what they're doing that day, yeah. you know? Right. And that's it takes like a certain type of person to want to engage in those discussions mm. that frequently. So what are the like greater ramifications of leaving the house at this time <laughs> right. you know, versus like an hour, hour later today? Yeah, yeah. 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 Whereas like, I love that, you know, but I, right. I recognize that not everyone loves that. Right. Right. <laughs> and yeah. That's that so, value system yeah. thing. It's just right or wrong it's you know do you share the same values and yeah and i i i totally agree i think this is so interesting this point that has been brought up it is it's this fine dance of yeah the integration of astrology it's it it is it's uh it is it's a tricky thing and it's funny mm-hmm. actually talking about it with you right because we're only talking to each other about it all right. the time so this is bringing in bringing to light some kind of because we're so insular mm-hmm. right because sure. right. we can't yeah. really t- like i have yeah. i'm lucky i have friends who speak this language so that's i get other outlets for this uh just my own personal experience of astrology but at the same time it 
now that I'm, we're stepping back and looking at it, it's kind of actually revealing to me, wow, huh, this plays a massive part in our life, you know, because right. you forget, oh yeah, people don't live like that. Yeah, right, it's right. things <laughs> that you take for granted and it's only once you step outside of it or start yeah. realizing how it could have gone a different way or how somebody else's life is different that you realize yeah. what the uniqueness is of the situation yeah. that you're in. Yeah. I, I think I actually had that realization again recently when we were doing some whether to elect certain things, setting up our new apartment. I was like, if either of us like thought this was super weird, like this would not work. <laughs> right. <laughs> like we wanted to like, we were going to do like this showing for the apartment and we were like, if we could just delay it by 10 minutes, we could get this other rising <laughs> sun. And yeah. we're like, okay, yeah. you you say that you have to go back to the house and like we will delay it by 10 minutes before walking in the door. Right. And we're both paying attention to the time as we walk in. Yeah, and but, I could just yeah. see like someone else who's not involved in any of these things yeah, just, just being just, like, you are a crazy person and yeah, we're not moving right. in together, yeah. you know? Yeah. So I mean, that would be really tough. And I just keep coming back to that statement that that would be really tough because that's all I can think. But there's a lot of people that find their selves in that. So I'm trying to think of, because I don't want to point to bleak of a yeah. scenario. And this is something that Lisa and I talked about beforehand is we were a little nervous about doing this because we're so we're presenting a certain perspective because right. both both couples are astrologers dating other astrologers or being in long-term relationships. And so we're obviously very pro that. And for each right. of us, especially since we're professional astrologers, this is more of like ideal scenario for us. But I don't want there. I know there's sometimes like people that listen to the podcast who are astrologers themselves, but their spouse isn't. But they still like play it in the car, and their spouse, <laughs> spouse for example, ends up hearing you know large large parts of the podcast. So I do right? not want to <laughs> freaking. Kids. I've had kids come up to me like, "Oh my god, you're so cool!" I'm like, "What? <laughs> right? It's a mom's car." <laughs> um, but I I don't want to paint a bleak scenario and say that it's like not possible to have a stable long term relationship with an astrologer, or for that to still be. Absolutely. a good permanent supportive and like great relationship if you don't aren't both there mm -hmm. um because i do think it's possible i just think um having some flexibility and some understanding and some openness to um trying to see where the per other person is coming from and trying to be considerate of that not just for the non astrologer partner towards the astrologer doing all this crazy stuff with electional astrology but also for the astrologer towards their non astrologer partner to try to be understanding of and even though like astrologers sometimes fall into the it's not a trap but it's something we all do of just taking for granted that the way that your life is and what your belief system is is the same for everybody mm -hmm. instead of like stepping outside of yourself and realizing that it looks it could look a little bit weird or it could look different for somebody else mm -hmm. and especially if you have a partner that's coming from that perspective to be try to be understanding of that. Mm -hmm. I mean, I think there are pros too. I think there are like positive things for not being in an astrology relationship. Yeah. Okay, sell Absolutely. me on okay. <laughs> being in a non-astrology relationship. I mean, I think one of the things is that very thing you just said, which is you sometimes forget like mm. how any of this sounds to anyone else who's not an astrologer. Okay, and you so get too much into the shorthand. They might keep you grounded. Yeah, they could keep you grounded mm -hmm. in like the the rest of the world. All right, um, I both, like that. So this yeah. is like top, 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 top five reasons to not date an astrologer. <laughs> right. right, now that we're where we're going with this. <laughs> yeah. yeah, I mean, yeah, so I think, you know, just keeping you kind of remembering what it's like to talk about, not just um, to talk about astrology with people who aren't astrologers, so you don't like get too much in your shorthand. Um, but I think also be being reminded that there are other ways to, other lenses through which to view the world. And astrology mm -hmm. is not the only like one true lens. Yeah. And it is like a very perceptive lens, but mm -hmm. it's certainly not the only one. Mm -hmm. um, and I've had that, I, I had a family member tell me that once, which is like, yeah, that's a good lens. You know, and it's like reminding mm -hmm. that there are other lenses through which you can think about the world and you don't have to stick to just this one. So I think that's actually really useful. Yeah, a lens or like a tool. Yeah. And that there might be other tools for looking at the world. I mean, even other like metaphysical tools like tarot, mm -hmm. like I could imagine like an astrologer dating like somebody that does tarot mm -hmm. and the differences in their approaches to some extent. Uh, not being necessarily the same. Mm -hmm. mm, yeah. yeah. That would work. Yeah. So I think, um, yeah, just keeping you connected to the rest of the world in a variety of ways is like a big pro. Okay. Yeah. Can we come up with like four more? Some other so ones? Just, like, <laughs> I would say decision making because is I pros, think- Is this pros for being an 
in an astrology relationship. To not being oh, in a To being in a relationship yeah. with okay. someone who's not an astrologer. Okay, decision making. Yeah, For the on. astrologer, yeah, like the, the benefits of an astrologer, hardcore astrology, let's say believer, quote unquote, being in a relationship with a non-astrologer. I think decisions, like we just actually had an experience just a couple days ago and <laughs> we were about to make a pretty big decision and we were referencing, well, Mercury is at 29 degrees of Pisces. Right. So this is like, we either needed to make, you know, this decision or this decision and somebody who they would go with maybe more of their gut, mm -hmm. right? They would take mm -hmm. it. I think that it can get so heady astrology. Mm -hmm. That it takes it out of the gut, it takes it out of the ground, it takes it out of the just the intuitive knowing or just listening to ourselves, and mm -hmm. uh, you know, it's, and it is frustrating. It's, those are those moments I think actually that are the moments that really I, I really dislike about being in a relationship with an astrologer. Is like I don't care that twenty nine. I don't care. I don't care that Mercury's at twenty nine. Right. Right. <laughs> and, and actually, I really don't. This is, he is more into this than I am. Okay. Mm -hmm. So like, I actually don't care where Mercury is right now making a decision. Mm -hmm. I just don't. Mm -hmm. Um, Unfortunately, I, we're going to be more on his side yeah, in, this, in this debate. Just Thanks, to, guys. Yeah, sorry. Thanks, guys. Uh, you're not just dating an astrology, you're dating an Egyptian as well. Yeah. Right. That's got nothing to do with it. Well, it does a little. I mean, because you're very spiritually minded and you're very, like, you've got that very symbolistic, symbolistic. Well, it's just, it's a, it's a case of how you interpret astrology. You know, for you, it's like if, if you're not happy or you are happy, the astrology's. Not as important, maybe. Is that what you mean? Well, I, I didn't mean to like cut you off or, or diminish what you're saying because I, you know, what well, the point you're making yeah. is actually really good that astrologers yeah. could be like paralyzed by yeah. the astrology. Like yeah. if we're both like we can't find an electional date yeah. and you know we need to yeah. do something important and we put it off or put off something where if we're dating a non astrologer, they would be like, we have to do this. Now. Yeah, yeah, let's yeah, get on exactly. with this. Now. Yeah, yeah, totally. <laughs> like, you. like, even the fact that we waited so, like, sometimes I think about how long we waited to meet for the first time. Sure. And I want to hit my head, you know. We were waiting. We're like, we have to be together at the Great American Solar Eclipse video <laughs> because you know it's like it's crazy, right? Like, it's like we should yeah. have met months yeah. before we did, mm -hmm. yeah. and we were just sitting there waiting to meet each other. The ticket had been bought, so it wasn't like we were going to change. It was cool that we could. We didn't even like, go see it. We were, you know, we saw it from Colorado, but. And so, you uh, know, what, what, what were you doing exactly? Uh, <laughs> we were hanging out. Okay. Yeah. I'm doing okay. You've seen, a, you've seen a movie or something during the eclipse. Okay. <laughs> You know, but but it's like it is. It's like, and, and the, there have been too many too many moments. I think like like this electional idea. We should have done something. <laughs> we should have made a big decision t two Co years common ago. Sense. Because common sense said, "Go mm -hmm. do that." That's mm -hmm. obvious. Everything is laid out for you to go do that. And I was like, "Oh, but there's too much in Pisces right now." That was me. You know, mm -hmm. like sure. oh. Mm -hmm. We, yeah. we kick each other for those moments sometimes. Like, why were we paying attention to that more than what we knew? Sure. So that yeah. is the struggle, and that's yeah. Fine. That will be a struggle because then let's say let's go back on the other side. So now we're like making astrologers sound neurotic, but then <laughs> the other side of that, of course, is like um, if you weren't paying attention at all, and like you just met up under or or you did something important and decided to like run off to Vegas and get married and like Mars and Venus and Pluto and like 20 asteroids were all conjunct <laughs> at like the same degree on that day. And mm -hmm. that just from a generic perspective, let's say was would not be like the ideal situation for like a long-term partnership mm -hmm. that you want to last for many years. Right. right? right. Or whatever that looks like from whatever perspective we're talking about. Right. Yeah. And it is, it's 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 a the chicken or the egg conversation it's it's the deep philosophy of being an astrologer which if you're drawn to astrology you're a deep philosopher this is the nature of people drawn to this especially as a profession uh but yeah it is it's well if we had chose that date would, mm -hmm. could we have worked through the challenges of those right or would it completely destroyed us mm -hmm. or you know it, and, it, and you'll right. never know right and were you supposed to get married at that certain time versus yeah. another if you just went and did it you know yeah. was that part of the plan for it to be a difficult relationship you mm -hmm. know and you get something from that or whatever sure. but yeah that's a whole meta issue i mean sometimes yeah. that's an issue in itself when you when the relationship starts at the beginning you see the charts and you see some of the difficulties and you have to make the decision should mm -hmm. i do this and am i 
willing to sign up for what that entails. Right. Yeah, should I even right. date this person? Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Right. From this industry right. or composite totally. or whatever. Yeah. Absolutely. Which is like can go either way in terms of like, um, no, that's not a valid thing to do, that you should be open to whatever the relationship is and not let the astrology preclude some experience versus on the other side of the spectrum. Sometimes the astrology just says exactly what it is and you knew ahead of time and walked into <laughs> no, wait a like a disaster mm -hmm. and... Um, yeah, I've been on like both sides of that mm -hmm. of like walking mm -hmm. into the relationship knowing pretty well and the astrology just like Because sometimes one of the issues astrologers run into is seeing the astrology but wanting it to be other than it is Right. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so like yes. maybe seeing that the astrology is not really good but like in their heart at the time really wishing that this could work out and trying to make it work um, and keep it, trying to make it work even if it's not. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. Sometimes that can be something that astrologers run into is you know, trying to ignore the astrology but still somehow having it work out that way. Right. And similarly, I mean, like seeing either through your disparate birth charts or seeing any timing coming up in e either of your charts, like thinking maybe this won't last for very long. And so is that a reason to not do it? Mm. Or is it is it just go ahead knowing that? Mm. You know, that's yeah. like a kind of corollary issue, like just seeing any of those things up front in the beginning of a relationship. Right. Yeah. Well, and that kind of, I think, brings another point why it would be advantageous to not be with an astrologer is when you're looking at the other's chart, you're, I think at the end of the day, all we have, I think to me, the greatest power of astrology is learning our chart and learning to embody it and embody ourselves and our own knowing. And when the other person is in, um, injecting ideas about who you are from their interpretation, you're getting to know your chart more. And so, for example, if, um, say your partner who doesn't know anything about astrology is, has, is having a Mars transit, you know, and they're very aggravated right now, or, um, you know, I, like I have an example of a gal, she kind of understands, um, Uranus, her husband's been going, you know, he's ended his Uranus opposition, but she knew that it was a passing thing for him mm -hmm. and she could really embody what she was needing to learn from it on her own terms from her own chart that it, yes he's going through these things but she can't dialogue that with him so i'm just going to instead see why is he my partner like why what is it that i'm needing to learn right now from him being in my 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 life and my energy field and kind of taking it into your own experience of how can i be a better partner how can i be a better human just only having this information in my own guidance, getting through life. Mm -hmm. This is my way to understand myself better, right. mm -hmm. not to understand you better necessarily mm -hmm. or us better. Just sure. this is about me becoming the best me I can be or something. Mm -hmm. I don't know if that made any sense. Yeah, well, I think that's an advantage, of, again, of having two astrologers. It's the advantage, yeah, but also. And if you're an astrologer and the other person isn't, Mm -hmm. Let's say, if, and we're looking at advantages of that at the moment, right? Mm -hmm. yeah. It's, it, I think, it takes a lot of responsibility for the astrologer. Let's say if they met somebody um, and they looked at the chart and it was like, "Wow, we're like really compatible. This is this is in incredible." If you start basing assumptions that they're gonna suddenly come running to your door because they might think no, they, they don't know who you are. They haven't even worked that out yet, mm -hmm. right? I think it might make the astrologer, in terms of the advantage of learning this, maybe more tolerant to that. I'll give them an advantage in sense of, well, I've still got to do the dance of, mm -hmm. of love and, and relationship, but maybe I can see be more empathetic, basically, you know, to the other in terms of, or looking at the signs of whether it's going to work or not. Mm. I think that's definitely an advantage. If you saw something that wasn't compatible, and then, you know, you start just testing the relationship like you would do in any relationship, getting to know somebody. Mm -hmm. And straight away it becomes obvious um, whether that's not compatible or not. Then maybe you can be less, um, you know, more discerning, should I say, mm. before getting into something. Mm -hmm. I don't know whether that's an advantage or not, or whether it's just the responsibility of being an astrologer. But certainly I think if you walked into something knowing that this is going to be difficult, because you're an astrologer, mm. 
you can be more discerning, can't you, from the start in terms of, is that what you mean? Or? I mean, I think you can try, but I mean, I, I tried that once. It was like an experiment where <laughs> I was like, this looks like a disaster. Okay. And then I was like, this was still, this was like the last experiment I had in my like free will modern astrologer phase of like, but I'm like, no, I want to overcome this and I will not be dominated by my stars. And right. um, it was just like the worst possible relationship. Right, right. And just like it was, it exceeded even my like worst expectations wow. in terms of like how badly it could have gone. Mm. Um, and it turned into like a stalker situation. And I was like getting harassed for like, years like after the relationship was over oh, and God. just like it was all there like in that chart ahead of time but i i very much thought oh, that wow. i would i really wanted to try it as an experiment of like maybe i can overcome the negative indications which mm -hmm. were both in like the sinistry and the natal charts and the transits and everything else mm -hmm. but it was one of those situations where it wasn't negotiable like sometimes there's like negotiable things mm -hmm. where yeah truly like you can go into it and you can negotiate things mm -hmm. or through hard work and dedication and perseverance you can like it becomes a surmountable difficulty but there's some things in life that you know it's not a matter of being able to change that mm -hmm. it's just something either you can accept and deal with or something which is just a deal breaker mm -hmm. um and sometimes that's the trickiest thing is you can't always know for sure with the astrological indications you can get pretty strong you know ideas but you may not always know ahead of time what's going to be negotiable and what's not. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And then, Go sorry. No, no. I was just going to say because the, the chart is still not the person. So exactly, even though yeah. the symbols might be really strongly saying something or some kind of flavor of something, you still don't know in the end before you go through knowing that person like exactly how it will be. You know? Absolutely. And, and then that's when the common sense, just obvious feeling mm -hmm. um, experience that isn't necessarily related to the heady, more kind of intellectual side. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You know, you just the actual obvious feeling mm -hmm. of right. traction or repulsion. Right, yeah. right. right. Yeah. It gives you clues, you know, yeah. but it doesn't give you the whole picture. And yeah. conversely, like if you see like a chart that looks really compatible with yours, it doesn't mean you're going to be in a relationship. Exactly. Because I've totally. had the reverse. I've like, had like so some true. weird circumstance like very early on in, in my astrological realm where like someone realized they had like the same placements at, by degree as like a bunch of my placements and they were like oh <laughs> and I'm like no like there's nothing going on here yeah. you know and it doesn't mean that oh. something will be going on yeah. just because you have the that sinistry but I have to say it's a fascinating point that because I think that really is the test of someone who is in the moment using astrology as a gift a tool as, as something that is of, of an advantage or benefit for humanity mm -hmm. rather than someone who is controlled and then lives their life by because that you can get duped in that sense mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Right. you look at something it looks perfect right but then there's loads of other factors that that you, you forget about like maybe that person is totally incompatible with you in, in an obvious sense right. maybe religiously mm -hmm. um economically age difference mm -hmm. but because you've looked at the chart and you think wow that is just so compatible for me because someone's taught me that our moons are in the same this or mm -hmm. any right. of that kind of thing yeah that is a, a real test i think for an astrologer to be able to discern accordingly in that regard because otherwise yeah. they're not living astrology they're actually they are consumed by astrology or, or it's controlling them mm -hmm. yeah if that makes any sense for sure yeah i mean there's a famous saying like the map is not the territory and i think that mm, speaks to this okay. you know and i did not oh, make I up that, that. that phrase but yeah i mean love i think that. astrology really uh speaks to that yeah it's like you get involved in a relationship where you think it looks perfect and suddenly you're in a sadomasochistic relationship mm -hmm. Yeah. I mean, what, and one of the issues that can come up also is you can have perfect sinistry, but the transits could be off. And mm -hmm. sometimes you run into the situation where this would have been a great relationship, would be a great mm -hmm. relationship 10 years from now, mm -hmm. but like one of you or both of you are not in the right place at the right time, right, or right. this would have been a great relationship 10 years earlier. Mm -hmm. well, yeah. But something about your transits at the time and where one or both of you are at the time just makes it so that it's not uh, right in that moment. Mm -hmm. Okay. Right. So how would you discern that then? Um, I mean, like one of the things could be like one of them's having heavy Uranus Venus transits at the yeah. time. And so their predisposition at the time might be for more like short term relationships or they're seeking more excitement rather than settling down into like a short term in a long term relationship. 
or maybe it's a Uranus transit that's like going through their fourth house or through their so that they're moving around a lot and they're not in a stable situation or it's going through their 10th house and they're deciding to like you know move abroad to to pursue their career or something like that not stay in their hometown for like a long-term relationship mm -hmm. i mean there's a lot of scenarios yeah. like that where you could have great synastry, but it just could not be the right time. Mm -hmm. um, there's other scenarios like zodiac releasing stuff, like mm -hmm. the person's major peak period for relationships maybe like ten years later, mm -hmm. and it's not like that that moment for like their most important relationship mm -hmm. for whatever reason. Right. Yeah. Or it may just turn into a great friendship. That happens with synastry as well as you mm -hmm. two date, yeah, definitely. but it doesn't end right. up becoming like a major long term. Like romantic relationship, but instead mm -hmm. it turns into like a platonic friendship or something mm -hmm. like that. Yeah, because usually you have good synastry with people you're friends with. Yeah, too. yeah. absolutely. And, and I think everything you just said there really highlights the difference between, you know, someone recognizing astrology for its benefits in terms of, you know, that that more methodical study of it than looking. Like, for example, let, we've all been there when we're starting off. I mean, my son compatible with your son right and then obviously anyone who studies astrology knows that there is just obviously so much more than sun sign astrology mm -hmm. but what you've just said there it's like it makes it even deeper because somebody could look at a chart and think this is perfect but then there's all that other thing to consider as well yeah that there's ultimately like so many factors going on mm -hmm. at any time that there's a lot that's like outside of your hands and sometimes even that makes some things like unknowable and as a result of that that unknowableness should humble you rather mm -hmm. than being arrogant about it and saying you know the future you know exactly how things are going to work mm -hmm. out in a mm -hmm. strict sense that you have to have some openness to like things going different ways mm -hmm. um yeah definitely well, and i love that you brought up to <laughs> when i saw tark's chart i didn't see <laughs> anything about our cultural differences <laughs> or our religious background differences or any I didn't even I couldn't have possibly predicted that mm -hmm. and then because I looked at these points in the chart I was like oh this is gonna be so cool you know I, I got excited and I didn't go too too um, into it but I got excited and then of course you know the rubber hits the road and you actually there are these nuances that just cannot be found in an astrology chart you know mm -hmm. they are and they're challenges that again can't be defined you, you know, you can't know someone's necessarily religious background looking at their chart or their um, cultural background or what country they're from or their ethnic background and all of these different things. And those things are profoundly effective. Mm -hmm. And and not just that, you can't, from an astrology chart, unless I know different, unless you, you can educate me here, guys, you know, whether when you actually get together. Physically. Whether that's going to go bang right. or not. <laughs> or ugh. If you see what I mean. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, there's well, there's a little bit of that that you can yeah. see in terms of like, do you guys have because there's different types of relationships that are going to have different strengths. So mm -hmm. it's like, do you have a lot of strong Venus and Mars aspects in your mm -hmm. synastry? And so mm -hmm. is the like physical element going to be there, or is that going to be your primary connection? Mm -hmm. Or do you have strong like Mercury connections for mm -hmm. like communication and the way that you guys think, or something like mm -hmm. that? Or do you right. have strong Sun and Moon connections for just like the emotional or underlying? Um, just like essence of of yourselves mm -hmm. and and some sort of connection bet between that. Mm -hmm. um, so there can be different levels in terms of that. And I think yeah, sometimes you can see like well maybe we'll get on more in this area of the relationship, mm -hmm. but we'll have mm -hmm. more difficulties or we won't connect as well in this area. But certainly you're right that when you actually get together like that can really and you see how it actually works out in person that can be a different level than just the abstract like what the astrology says definitely yeah it's much more fleshed out rather than just like a single symbol yeah yeah um, literally yeah right <laughs> yeah. Literally. literally yeah <laughs> all right that, that is the highlight that's the uh phrase of the episode <laughs> <laughs> yes, right. it's, re it's real, isn't it? Unless it's on a screen. <laughs> yeah. But yeah. Yeah. You know, there's just these very, like, you could call it crude or obvious aspects, you know, mm. to the birds and the bees or just relationship or whatever kind of relationship it is. It, if you're working for somebody and they're not paying you enough or, you know, there's these kind of like deal breakers that happen in relationship, which a chart could think there's lots of compatibility. Right. But the actual you know third dimensional physical reality or yeah. doing life together mm -hmm. you know you, you there might be 
subconscious thought patterns in the past that got nothing to do with astrology, yeah. which create you know issues yeah. related to um, um, you know actually getting on with life, mm -hmm. yeah. which you can see in the astrology to a certain extent. Mm -hmm. But again, it's the actual communication. I think it really is the key, you know, mm -hmm. to relationship, being able to communicate and being able to just get on, you know. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. It's just obvious, really, isn't it, when you think about it? But we have like this tool that we are talking about now, which maybe makes us see things a bit differently. Mm -hmm. Sure. Yeah. yeah. All right. Um, so we're getting towards the end of this. I'm just trying to browse through our outline and through some of that. We received a bunch of great questions and comments on Twitter. So thanks to everybody who sent those in. Uh, sorry if we didn't get to all of them. I'm just trying to see if there's any other things that we wanted to touch on before we wrap it up. Um, Anything? Yeah. Um, I don't know. Did we cover all the ones that we, the questions that we highlighted earlier? Um, yeah, I think we honestly did. I okay. mean, we uh, touched on. So there was uh, Alicia Yusuf who does the Water Trio podcast with Kelly. She commented that the plus of dating another astrologer is knowing each other's charts and the understanding and forbearance that can come with that. The minus is the same, but with assumptions and judgments come in, that come into play. So I think we've covered that pretty well in terms of that being, you know, some of the core struggle to some extent. Mm -hmm. Sorry. Mm -hmm. Did you want to say something? I did, but it Please looks like to. you want to. No, no, so. you go for it. Oh, thank you. Um, one of the things I just wanted to quickly uh, mention in here, you talked about stealing each other's transits. Yeah. And yeah. I think that's a kind of interesting concept. You know, when one partner's going through one transit and it's so deeply affecting your life and things of that nature, it's a little bit different for us because we're going through the exact right, same transit right. <laughs> literally all the time. Um, but what is, I I'm, I'm just want to hear more personally, I want to hear a bit more what that looks like for you too. Uh, okay. I can explain that one. <laughs> Go ahead. Said, I mean, this was, was your observation, but I'll yeah. explain it generally. So I had this like, um, well, Lisa was having a Jupiter transit once that was connected with her seventh house. And um, I it was going exact and she was like waiting for some really amazing stuff to happen in her life and then I just had this amazing month where <laughs> I like discovered like the origin of I published a paper on how the four elements came to be assigned to the signs of the zodiac and I gave like the commencement speech at Kepler College and I um, ended up like on Fox News for some reason like <laughs> predicting that Hillary would run in 2016 and then What's weird is thinking about that now, I never made this connection. I think I always also launched the podcast within a mm -hmm. month of that transit. Mm -hmm, that's true. So I just like was mm -hmm. knocking it out of the park <laughs> and we realized what was happening, or Lisa realized much to her dismay that <laughs> her seventh house Jupiter transit was manifesting in my life and like amazing stuff happening to right. me. Right. But then she's like, but I, I what about me? Like, <laughs> I was where... like you're stealing my Jupiter transit. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> So that's she, the catchphrase. <laughs> she fondly referred to that as me stealing her Jupiter yeah. transit. <laughs> yeah. 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 And that was before, anyway, that was kind of like before I switched from purely modern Western mm. astrology because mm. that would be like, it's my Jupiter transit versus mm. more traditional would be like, yeah, right. but it's connected right. to your seventh house. <laughs> yeah. That sometimes so. the other houses are literally like the other people in your yeah. life. Yeah. And sometimes it doesn't have anything to do with you. It's just yeah, yeah. like a, a transit can be showing something that's happening in the life of somebody close to you. Yeah. Right. Well, which brings up a really good point from the whole sign perspective or the Hellenistic perspective. Uh, so I'm with a super Sag man. I have Sagittarius in my seventh with Jupiter, Uranus, and Neptune. And every man I have been with has been super Sag. Hmm. Maybe not by sign, maybe, you know, but they all share the same characteristics, mm -hmm. right? They're all just like <laughs> the same kind of energy. You know, I like, you know, foreigners and people who travel and, you know, love to see the world and things of that nature. And so that's a really good um, thing that you kind of crossed over there is just if you are not dating an astrologer, uh, look, you know, it, it's still the person in your life is still going to mirror your, your chart mm -hmm. and you'll know a lot about them from your own chart. You right. know, even if you never see your partner's chart, you'll probably have like a good understanding of what they'll be going through based on your chart from a Hellenistic mm. perspective, mm. Right. Yeah. which I think is really interesting. Anyway, yeah. And that's one of the coolest things I think about dating another astrologer is being able to make some of those observations and then like immediately tell the person and share that because mm -hmm. mm -hmm. yeah. then you're actually learning together and you're like accelerating your learning in some way. Mm -hmm. yeah, well, that's definitely, definitely happened with us. Mm. 
I think if you just want to say an advantage of, of, of a, a, you know, to dating a non astrologer mm-hmm. is that suddenly there's no competitive kind of aspect. <laughs> oh, yeah. Oh, that's you. <laughs> so, you know, right. In yeah. relation to that career that's or just one. astrology that's or, mm-hmm. you know, potential or anything like that. And as long as that person has a respect for what you're doing, because I think it becomes detrimental when that person, you know, is trying to control what you're doing or sees it as negative, then obviously then it's going to be a really difficult situation because mm-hmm. obviously the practicing astrologer is going to be compromised or they're going to feel undervalued for what they're doing. So mm-hmm. that's just straight away not going to work, I would have thought, unlikely anyway, um, or unless it's a test of integrity to keep going to educate the other, to you know, so they concede... Either way, it's a challenging situation. But if somebody has respect for what you're doing and yet they give you the space, likewise, they have their interest and you give them the space, mm. it could work really well then. Yeah, yeah definitely. That's a good point. Yeah. Sure. Yeah. The competition, the battling of the minds of the astrologers. <laughs> sure. That's a huge point. That's great. Yeah. In some um, ways, it's easier that than it is being two astrologers. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Sure. Yeah, because if you're both in the same career field, then there's yeah. some competition just naturally. Right. Mm-hmm. Um, I'm reading through other questions. So Max Higley uh, on Twitter, at Max Hig- Higley, says, I think a good point to touch on is how astrology can negatively impact a relationship. In 2017, I dated this girl, and I constantly checked her birth chart, transits, progressions, lunar returns, to a point mm-hmm. where it became obsessive and almost invasive. Yeah. And that brings up a broader point I noticed, because I noticed this hanging around older astrologers, like when I got to know like Rob Hand or Demetra George, is that I noticed a difference between there's some, usually like there's a phase that newer astrologers go through in the first few years of their study where they're just studying astrology intensely and they know everything about their own chart and everything that's going on and they're checking it regularly. They know like all their friends and family members chart. Mm -hmm. If they have a partner, they know what's going on in their chart and they're just like tracking all of that sort of obsessively, which is fine and that's a stage everyone goes through and it's a perfectly healthy to some extent stage to go through as a natural part of the process of learning astrology. But there is a point where at some point I think that levels out a little bit and sometimes you don't always need to know constantly like what's going on or be tracking it constantly or focusing obsessively on that. I know some of the older astrologers that I know, while they have a general idea of some of the stuff going that's going on, they don't obsess about their own chart or the charts of people around them necessarily in the same way as a newer astrologer would. And obviously mm-hmm. that that's going to vary like depending on the astrologer and right. from person to person. I'm sure there's different levels of intensity, but I just know that that's there's different phases in an astrologer's career and that's going to be different being in a relationship with an astrologer depending on where they're at in terms of that mm-hmm. their phases of that mm-hmm. true yeah i would agree with that i mean and yeah. then i know at certain points like we had that discussion where like you felt more like that was true that most astrologers after a while didn't focus on it as much right. and i was like i don't think that's true for everyone though that's like mm-hmm. one way you can go with it um you know because i was still looking at a lot of things more in detail but i right. think the difference though i think it's still true in general and i think the difference is whether you switch to focusing on it as a learning tool and as more of just mm-hmm. like a, a general part of your life with astrology versus like mm-hmm. obsessing in a more like ego driven fashion or in a like like neurotic or worrying fashion Right. Well, one yeah. of the things that you learn uh, becoming a psychotherapist is don't analyze the people in your life. Just don't do it. <laughs> yeah, there's okay. that too. <laughs> don't, don't do it. Right. So I was, I'm, I'm, I feel somewhat fortunate that I've never really um, dug into my family's charts. Hmm. Um, really? Nor his. Yeah, that that that's gonna put you on as an outlier, though. Yeah, I am. Yeah, definitely. Okay. Well, and I was seeing clients. I mean, that's fine. I'm not saying there's anything wrong right. with. It. I'm just saying mm-hmm. that's not typical it's the for exception. an astrologer yeah, yeah yeah uh and i and one of the very first like readings i gave was to a friend mm-hmm. and i will you know I, i've kind of i've slipped past that many times mm-hmm. i've i've made so is it like do not like for me do not do not read your friend starts period that that is a no go not happening for me because the imbalance becomes so great between myself and the friend because i see all this stuff and they don't see it about me. Sure. And yeah. so we, it's really, I've lost friends because of this. Uh, and so for my family members, I think I in, inherently, because of my training, knew don't, don't do it. Mm-hmm. And, and, and every once in a while I will look rarely mm-hmm. and, and I'll, oh, oh yeah. Like I realized maybe 
you know, seven years into it. Oh yeah. My Uranus is on my brother's moon. Everything I do makes him mad. (laughs) Like Mm. I can't say anything right to him. Uh, and I kind of recognize that about him, but I really don't, I don't I, like, I kind of know my dad's, I know my dad's going through a nodal return right now. And so am I, but I don't want to look, I don't want to see where, what degree, how hmm. I just, I don't want to know. Hmm. I don't, I just don't. I want to be with my family as is. And, and also I'm again, between us, I'm less involved in our charts than he is. Mm-hmm. Uh, Cause I just, I want to just be with him. You know, I want to be with, um, I want to, and because again, I come from the psychotherapeutic background, I'm a lot more interested in his neurology and his um, patterns and watching him with, you know, his families and his, his friends and seeing how he interacts and then, oh yeah, and that's affecting our relationship from that. So I think I just have such a unique training that has taught me don't get people mm-hmm. in your life involved in this stuff because yeah. it becomes not not great sometimes. I mean, the curiosity though of has never driven you to look at like your parents' charts. I've looked, I've peeked at them. Okay. I know their sun, moon rising. I I know, but I know very little. I think I think to be honest though, it's like when you know you look at a chart and then it's a case of you start to form an opinion mm-hmm. because it's hard not to. So sometimes like actions can be taken. Of, well, it's a, this is pretty obvious, you know because if you've looked at someone's chart, right. and then you may think, you know, family included, mm-hmm. might come to a point where, well, I'm gonna be a little bit more tolerant now at this particular time, or I'm gonna maybe make a move just in case anything happens. And all that kind of aspects of responsibility in astrology, you can't really ignore. Yeah, I mean, it's just like with, parents and family members, for example, that's one of the weird inversions though. And I think that's why new students oftentimes, those are some of the first charts that they'll look at because you already have an opinion. Like you've been mm-hmm. living with these people mm-hmm. for your entire life, like okay. your, let's say mother and father and siblings or aunts and uncles or whatever, you know them and you have already pretty formed opinions about who they are. Let's mm-hmm. say you're 15 or 20 or 30 years old at that point, mm-hmm. And then you learn astrology and then all of a sudden, you could look at their chart and that gives you a slightly different perspective on that person but it's one of the unique instances where you've already formed opinions and then you get to see look at it through the lens of astrology to see what that looks like mm-hmm. versus with new relationships yeah. it's the opposite and that's mm-hmm. where right. it becomes more problematic because there is more of a danger of mm-hmm. forming an opinion about the person based on the chart mm-hmm. before you get to know them mm-hmm. sure mm-hmm. yeah 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 i mean i know enough basic like I know, I don't know my dad's rising sign because of his, um, he had, we don't know it. Uh, but I, you know, I know, I know actually I did a family tree of sun, moon rising for all the way back to great grandparents because mm-hmm. uh, we have times on a lot of people and it was the same three basically repeat, repeat through my entire family lineage, but it stopped right. there for me. Uh, mm-hmm. Because I mean, that, I, that's really cool, though. Like doing that kind of research or seeing that must yeah, have informed right. like something about your practice and oh, like just that that's possible. That's actually part of my data points I keep is with families charts and it's just mm-hmm. a remarkable it's remarkable yeah, what definitely. repeats. It's yeah. Like DNA patterns and cosmic patterns are not different. Right. They just aren't. Yeah. And I don't know how who or why or you know, you know, but we figured that out. Only in 1970 we figured out blood patterns are repeated. One day somebody will also be like, yeah, it repeats in the sky. But regardless, I think for me, because again of the psychoanalytical aspect of my training, I don't want to psychoanalyze my family, my friends. And uh, I, I, it's kind of like a boundary thing for me mm-hmm. more than a, a learning tool. Like my mom's an Aquarius rising. Uranus conjunct her son and Gemini in the fifth. I don't need to look at anything more than that because that basically says everything I need to know about. Um, I want to leave it there mm-hmm. with her. I yeah. don't want to. I, I. That's enough for me to metabolize, sure. right? So it's it's a boundary thing, and I don't want. I want to be with them and present to them and the dynamics that we do have together, which are good and bad, mm-hmm. um, rather than. I don't know. It, sure. It's a personal. Yeah, yeah I mean, thing. I think some of it is a boundary thing, and that can be applicable through like any of these situations. Yeah. Um, I think probably it also 
um, lends itself to like what type of astrology each astrologer Absolutely. is practicing. Absolutely. Because if you're not like really focusing on the psychological aspects as much, right. then I think it maybe feels like less intrusive yeah. personally. Absolutely. Potentially. I mean, you could still yeah. see things. You can yeah. see lots of things, but. Um, right. And it, I don't know why this it brings it up, but it made me think of the one of the ethical things. This is like a whole other tangent, but one of the ethical things that um, I think Esar and NCGR adopted when they were developing their ethical codes like 20 or 30 years ago in the late 90s, 20 years ago, um, is they did incorporate some things from the um, psychological and like psychoanalytic models mm -hmm. that were standard like ethical things in terms of boundaries and what are appropriate yeah. versus what are not appropriate boundaries. And one of those is, you know, quite obviously, but sometimes people don't think about it until it's articulated, but don't date clients. Mm -hmm. yeah. Or if you've seen somebody as a client, if you're a professional astrologer and you've mm -hmm. seen somebody as a client, that there's like a window of, I mean, one of them actually tries to specify Isn't it. Like, it like they, six months or something? Yeah, they try to yeah. say like six months that if you've seen somebody as a client in the last six months, then you absolutely should not be than dating them, and mm -hmm. that's partially to obviously to protect clients mm -hmm. and ensure that there's no impropriety on the part of the um, astrologer, which makes sense. But it mm -hmm. it actually raises. I've seen instances where this raises and brings up kind of a tricky issue when you're talking about because that's ideally it's designed for the situation where you have a professional astrologer and a non-astrologer client, right? Which is the most delicate situation because mm -hmm. then there's mm -hmm. a huge power imbalance. But there can sometimes be instances where you have a professional astrologer and then you have other professional mm -hmm. astrologers that sometimes like go around just to do consultations right. to see how other astrologers practice. Yep, right. And there there's less of a power differential yeah. and there's more parity. And so there becomes yeah. a question there of if those two professional astrologers end up dating at one point, was there some sort of ethical breach just mm -hmm. by virtue of the fact that at one point one of them read the other's chart yeah. and just issues like that? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. And I think one of the things, so in psychotherapy, it's going to be a much more severe thing because of the legalities and things of that nature. But one of the first things that we learn is if you do find yourself attracted to a client, tell them immediately and end it there. Mm. We, I, I, I got to say I'm attracted to you. And... I, I, this is, I don't want to engage in a client therapist relationship. And then you can wait. I think it's much longer to date. Mm -hmm. It's a, it might be a couple of years actually, or something ridiculous like that. Mm -hmm. But because we talk about this in psychotherapy all the time, like you, there's going to be some people who walk in your office that if you're single, mm -hmm. you're going to find attractive. There's, and they're going to be telling you their intimate details. And so before you even start, you say, I'm not your astrologer. I'm not your therapist. We are, we can go through forward as colleagues or in the case of two astrologers, me. I mean, we were two astrologers who met, mm -hmm. right? So it was, and even coming from the, the psychotherapeutic background I came from, I had to think ethically about it. Like, well, he's in the community. I am an astrologer of the community, but he's also an astrologer. So I had to actually think about some of that on my end when we were starting to get to know each other. And I mm -hmm. said to him immediately, you're my colleague. I will never be your astrologer. You mm -hmm. need to know that right now. And I didn't tell him because I think you're <laughs> super fly um, <laughs> because, it, you know, but at the time, like when we were getting to know each other, I was very clear about that. I'm mm -hmm. not your teacher. I'm not your astrologer. You're my colleague and right. we will converse as such. Yeah. Right. Yeah. And and it's a huge, it's a huge piece of the conversation that we're, I, for me, that's kind of what I'm trying to bring more into astrology because I, and we've talked about this before, I just know so many astrologers who have cross boundaries uh, on many, many different levels. And, uh, you know, we talked about it with Adam the last time we yeah. were together. I mean, one of the things though I wanted to emphasize, I was quick to emphasize then and I want to bring up again now is like, I know that there are sometimes astrologers who can, who've crossed boundaries, but for the most part, I feel like the vast, vast majority of Haven't. interactions of yeah, between like client and of astrologer course. are like pretty above board. Yeah. No, I totally agree. I think I get so, again, because of my training, it affects me a bit differently because mm -hmm. I came from such rigorous ethics uh, that for me, it's it like I hear these stories, and it, it unfortunately it gets magnified in my mind about things I've heard. But I agree, there's plenty of this not happening. And as long as we're having these conversations, that's the most important, just to get people to think 
about, okay, well, when do you want to bring your family's chart in? Or like, I've made major mistakes with the, like, I've even, I hate to say it, but I've peeked at some of the charts of people in his life and I shouldn't have. I should have just Why? Not... You think that was wrong? Well, now they have opinions on me. Well, right? I, th- I and think it's affected I th- our relationship. I think it's more when we look, when we look at um, the situation of trying to help and be of service right. mm-hmm. as of compared to being a client. Mm-hmm. Where you know someone's actually asked you to read their chart and paid pay, you, paid you to read their chart, mm-hmm. and then when you are offering opinions, when because you think you're doing the right thing, or someone is like going, "Oh yeah, I'd like my chart read," and you just do it, you know, in, not in the cons- consultation way, yeah. right? Mm-hmm. Right, just casually. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Then it can become problematic because that person hasn't necessarily valued that exchange and that service, mm-hmm. and then suddenly if one's offered an opinion and then it's taken against them, I, you know, they might have been offering value in the sense of, look, this is your core issue right now. I'm sharing that with you. Um, but then suddenly, because it's, because it's, it's come along, not in the right, the professional way or, you know, what, what has been a consultation and all that, it could be used against you. Yeah. I don't think it's as, as, as like critical maybe as we're portraying it here, but, You've got to be careful when it comes to family and stuff like that when you're offering opinions that are professional. Yeah, or certainly Mm -hmm. like unsolicited opinions. Yeah, That's like a big one Mm -hmm. that astrologers need to be careful about that sometimes, Mm -hmm. especially if you're newer, can be not just a temptation, but I'll see newer astrologers like offering unsolicited opinions or unsolicited delineations, especially like it's funny, like in a social context, like at a conference, like walking up to somebody and that's such it's like a funny thing with the podcast is occasionally I don't even want to mention this because I want to open it up to <laughs> having it like happen 20 times just to be able yeah. to mess with me at right. Norwalk or something. <laughs> but like somebody knowing just because they know your chart that they can walk up yeah, and like yeah. start talking to you about it or right. saying, making statements yeah. about your life mm-hmm. based on it. Like I had somebody send me an email like that like a few months ago and I had to I actually wrote it. It was a very impressive response, but it was a very curt response, just being like, that was a very good delineation. However, I did not ask you for it. And in the the future, when you're interacting with other professional astrologers, they may react more strongly if you Mm -hmm. give an unsolicited delineation Mm -hmm. that they they didn't ask for, regardless of how accurate or correct it is. It's just something you don't do. And that's obviously that's a, almost a whole other separate topic, but it yeah. almost kind of gets tied in here because it could come up both between astrologers, you know, almost like psychoanalyzing each other in a relationship, mm-hmm. or an astrologer saying things to a non-astrologer in a relationship, and sometimes that's not really appropriate, even if your intentions yeah. are, are good. Right. Absolutely. Right. Yeah. Well, and it's true mm-hmm. when you're when like when it's you know family members or friends or people close then to each other. Uh, it forms an opinion then of us about them, right? And how they'll support the relationship uh, because, well, I remember when Eugenia said this one thing and they hang on to it. And the thing that's so powerful about us when we give astrological information, it is grounded in something we can see. We're not just intuiting this. We just aren't. That's not Mm -hmm. (laughs) some of it, sure. But like, it's pretty like, clear because we've seen it repeat so many times that this so they don't understand how you saw it where it came from but but it 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 lands in people deeper than like a tarot reading it just does from my experience and so when it lands in these people who are in a relationship with you that is friendship family or something in that closer circle it can really i've found it has had mostly negative impact on me with other relationships that are intimate in my life. And I, I'm at this point, like, no, no, if I, if I want to have lunch with you in the future, I'm not going to read your chart period. I will give you some maybe general, very general loose interpretations, but I'm not going there because I've had such a negative, but you told me this one. I I can't, I want to have dinner with you. I'm going to like, how's your daughter? Mm -hmm. (laughs) I don't want to go there. I just, please, you know, I think, you know, for me, yeah. In in terms of responsibility, in terms of, you know, suddenly the astrologers in the, in the, in the, at the party, you know, or at the house. And this is kind of like entertaining or interesting, but you know, generally everybody wants to get the chart read. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And then obviously then there becomes a certain caution 
or certain a certain degree of um, responsibility connected to how you share that information with people close in the family. Mm, yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I mean, I think what you seem to be getting at is like when you're you're in a sort of authority role when yes. you're speaking as an astrologer yeah. and like you're trying to sort of assert that you know something that you wouldn't know otherwise yes. um, or you know it from at least a different angle than you wouldn't know otherwise. Yes. And so it's like, do you relate as on the same level as just as people connecting versus like, and that can be with regard to dating situations or it can mm-hmm. be with regard to these other, you know, family or friend situations where like, do you stay in that role of like authority figure when you're like not on the clock yes. or you're, you know, and that's obviously like an issue that comes up, I think probably more like earlier on because you're constantly learning and it's you're really true. excited about it. That's and true. so you want to talk about it all that's the time true. versus I think later and especially if people make it their profession versus their hobby, yeah. which is I think a big distinction. Um, then there is a division between I'm on the clock and yeah. acting as an authority figure that you asked me to be right. versus I'm offering unsolicited opinions about your life or your personality or what have you right yeah well just really quickly before i met tark i I was interested in this fella and he didn't know anything about astrology and i asked him for his birth time and i think that's actually what had him like like, i I don't yeah like you want to see and i pulled it up and i looked at it and i think i could feel even in him like this is weird you mm-hmm. asked somebody else. You asked the guy oh. I wanted to date. Mm-hmm. Okay, and he, I he I was like, oh, and he's like, this no, yeah. uh-uh, no, I don't want you to look at me. Why? Sure. And he didn't. He was like obliging me. He's like an astrologer, but then he could see pretty quickly from my reaction that I understood who he was. Yeah. And there was no, there was no way there was going to be a relationship at that point because mm-hmm. right away it was imbalanced. Sure. Right. It was yeah. just. We couldn't come to this from equal playing fields because um, he was. It was going to take him longer to get to know me than for mm-hmm. me to get to know him. Mm-hmm. For the, from that instance, mm-hmm. and so and that's kind of circling back to this whole conversation to date or to not date an astrologer. Regardless, the organic getting to know a human, I think, is the most important piece. Yeah, with our partners, with our friends, even with our clients to an extent, right? It's. Okay, so I see all this stuff in your chart, and like, how are you feeling today? Like, mm-hmm. what's going on in your? How are you feeling today? Right, and and that's this thing we're trying to learn in astrology. I, I liked what you mentioned about humility. Mm-hmm. I thought that was really sage a, a perspective, really, because you know we think we know a lot yeah. about somebody else, and the chances are, having studied it for a long time, that there is a certain degree of precision. That's what makes astrology different, maybe from other esoteric arts um but yeah we don't really know yeah and that's where the humility comes in yeah i mean astrology is not it's not a crystal ball where you look into it and you see like a movie of exactly what's going to happen in the future yeah. it's like you're working with symbolism and there's a certain abil- uh, amount of um what is it interpretation interpretation but mm-hmm. also um not pliability but like um things are a little bit flexible in terms of the interpretation of those placements so that while sometimes you can feel pretty strongly and get a pretty good um, hit about what it's going to indicate, especially if there's like multiple factors all saying the same thing, there's still a level where it's not until it happens that that you see it for sure like play out. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And up until that point, you've not exactly seen the future as if it's a movie you've seen this like abstract Mm -hmm. thing and Mm -hmm. you're making an inference about what's going to happen and as a result of that um, that lack of omniscience you have to adopt some level of humility Mm -hmm. Um, Mm because if you don't if you go the other direction which there's some like small amount of astrologers that do you're really just kind of pretending and you're going too far about pretending as if you have these like magical powers that you don't necessarily possess Mm -hmm. um like astrology is you can do a lot with astrology and you can see way more than you should be able to see Mm -hmm. (laughs) and it can do things that are incredibly impressive that you know it shouldn't if it could only do like a 10 percent of what it can actually do then it would still be amazing but it actually goes Mm -hmm. way way beyond that but nonetheless there's still um limitations to it and being cognizant of that if you apply that not just to you apply that to every area as an astrologer, relationships is just one of the areas where adopting some level of humility is is yeah. useful. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Well, and just a, a side note about the predictive piece, especially if you're a parent. I've All watched right. so many mothers just 
go way too dark, way too deep because they see their, the transits coming in their children's charts. And it is, you know, we don't have children here, so we haven't, that's, that's a good conversation to have with people who have astrologers who have children, what that's about. But I've, again, it's just, you have like faith, like, Mm -hmm. even if it is a hard transit coming, there's a reason for it. There's Mm -hmm. a growth point from it. There's like the humility that you don't know what's going to happen to your child. You just don't. And worrying about it is. I think the ambiguity, unknown and humility, all these things, which makes it not the gospel yeah, and makes us not godlike. Yeah. It, you know, there's there's an aspect of God within all of us, we could say. There's an aspect of divinity in astrology. But at the end of the day, we're human. Yeah. And that means we're prone to mistakes. Um, we all have different opinions, different conditions to make us perceive certain things differently. Some people are more learned, but then you go to a Socratean kind of aspect, we don't know anything. So with all that in mind, why why does the playfulness suddenly become too serious mm-hmm. regarding looking at somebody and, and 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 why does that suddenly rather than just the innocence of getting to know somebody become so complicated in this sort of yeah. intellectual postulation mm-hmm. and all of that discredits the beauty of this gift that we've been given really when if we could approach it with a certain degree of like say unknown humility ambiguity then it could become much more potentially a much more integrated thing rather than something that's feared. Mm -hmm. Sure. Mm -hmm. Right. I mean, I think it's because, I think you said that really beautifully. Thank you. Um, uh, But (laughs) like, I think um, the, you know, it's because astrology is about knowing things and people get into it because they want to know things Mm -hmm. that it becomes sort of a more deliberate thing that you have to remember is that there's still a piece of unknowing and that there still are, you know, it doesn't mean we know everything. So well, yeah. for as much as he does use astrology and looks at it, he's the one who's been like, bring it here, bring it here. He's what has completely revolutionized my practice as an astrologer is, and just my life as an astrologer is bring it to your heart. <laughs> you know, mm-hmm. Like, mm-hmm. what is your heart feeling right now? I'm like, all oh, right, sure. I have one of those. <laughs> right. For me, I can't believe that I'm here right now, really. I mean, am I actually on a trip right now? Yes, I'm traveling. But, but seriously, it's like, I think if people have a degree of, again, humility is the right word, if we look at Jupiter Sagittarius right now, and also we look at the idea of the, sometimes we become our innocence to express uh, without all, let's say, a million books that we've read, just an authentic perspective on things is valuable. Mm-hmm. But ultimately, if we become too like controlled by something, anything, whether it's astrology or anything, we're really m- missing the innocence mm-hmm. in the unknown of, of how it came to us in the first place. I mean, we didn't know any of this until we studied it. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. we've practiced it we've become more experiential with it so that's great because it's a value service that's what astrology is all about but when we miss the innocence and the kind of the unknown then we really make it far more serious and far more complicated than it needs to be right yeah i mean i'm there with you intellectually in theory but in practice like, <laughs> no, we're pretty same. much looking at charts like all the time so uh <laughs> There's a science to it. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's it needs to be balanced, and and that's ultimately. Um, I don't know if this is relevant, but Ptolemy, the way that Ptolemy in the second century, I'm going to invoke Ptolemy. <laughs> The way, that, the way that he defines benefic and malefic is actually really interesting because mm. those sound like like such black and white and mm. and weird concepts in modern times. But the way that he actually defines that is really fascinating from a philosophical perspective, where he says the malefics. Are often experienced as problematics because they tend to swing towards extremes, mm. whereas the benefics are experienced as more subjectively positive because they tend towards moderation. Mm. And so, hmm. if you think of benefic and malefic in terms of swinging, going too far in one extreme or another mm. versus adopting moderation, I mean, what we keep coming back to here is just in all things, attempting to adopt moderation, especially yeah. when it comes to integrating astrology into relationships. Mm-hmm. And if you do that without going too far to one extreme or another, you'll probably be able to find a balance that's like appropriate and acceptable and like sustainable, mm-hmm. especially for the non-astrologer in the relationship. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And then we don't seem we don't yeah. seem to be 
you know, high and mighty or, you know, we can actually be a bit more playful and fun. Mm -hmm. And then it becomes something that the majority of people who maybe not practicing astrology might have a certain degree of, uh, what's the word, attraction to then. Sure. Mm -hmm. And then we're bringing it back to a more sort of like, I guess, um, a co commercial point of view, if that's the right word, way to say it. Right. Because if a non-astrologer is with an astrologer, and an astrologer has all this understanding of, let's say, predeterminism, and mm -hmm. you know they, they can work everything out from a scientific point of view, mm -hmm. there's not much play then, is there, in the unknown yeah. between mm -hmm. two people? Mm -hmm. right. And that's sometimes that innocence, that unknown, makes a thought another dimension. Right. Mm -hmm. Or just the experience itself of being together. I think we've been kind of yeah. talking around both of those things, like most of this episode. Yeah. Yeah. So that being paramount, that being the most important thing. Mm -hmm. And just one kind of, I know we're wrapping up here, but will you describe the Ankh, the Egyptian Ankh? Because this is one of the things, we see the Ankh a lot, the symbolism a lot. But the way Tarek interprets it as an Egyptian, I, I think it's a very like powerful image that you relay when you're describing you know it's not the cross it's not this hard linear thing it's this cross with the the loop the circular piece and well there's there's many different interpretations but of i it. like yours <laughs> in terms of my Your, playfulness yeah and also how it's affected us yeah. in terms of grounding mm -hmm. um it's just it's just that sort of idea of of energy flow mm -hmm. going through the heart and then to the third eye or to the brain and then coming back down and then grounding. Is that what you mean? Yeah, exactly. Yeah. It, like you have to do both mm -hmm. the ground and the it's, it's the earth and the stars. Right. And if, then the, if you look at it from this point of view up here, the mind, mm -hmm. the third eye, whatever consciousness, astrology, it's heady. Mm -hmm. And then if you look at the ground, which is just not so much in the mind, it's just cultivation, eating and stuff. Mm -hmm. But is that movement, that play, and when it goes into the heart space, mm -hmm. which is quite relevant to relationships, I guess. Yes. If we're communicating in that sort of figure of eight or onk sort of play and flow, then that's how we're using it as far as I'm concerned. Yeah. But I, I've just, people have taught those things and there's far greater authorities on that. No, I, Eugenie, I like this guy. I see what, <laughs> like if you could stick around and just tell me about stuff like that all night like i would, I would right? appreciate it yeah it's he's a great counter vortex in the vortex of astrology you know and he yeah. knows so much about it yet somehow he's able to recognize okay bring it here bring it here bring it here you know so yeah i mean that's way better than lisa has to put up with me invoking like ptolemy <laughs> statements every every five sentences <laughs> <laughs> All right, guys. I think we are at the end yeah. of this episode. Yeah. Uh, we did it, and yeah. this was great. Thank you so much yeah, for it was all great. joining. Yeah, thanks me. for Thank coming. Yeah, Spread really. the bravery mm -hmm. of us all. Right <laughs> yeah, we did it. Uh, this was an experiment. This is the first four-person episode in person of the Astrology Podcast. Yeah, definitely not the last. Yeah. Um, where can uh, Eugenia? We can find out more information about you and your podcast at accessibleastrology.com. Yeah, and just Accessible Astrology the podcast and. On Instagram, Accessible Astrology. I love Instagram. It's my new thing. Yeah, you're really good at it too. I love, yeah, I love your like, post. This is my new favorite thing. Right. <laughs> yeah. So. And anyway. Tarek, where can people find out more information about um, you? I'm a bit underground at the moment, so you'd have to dig deep to find me. <laughs> okay. <laughs> I mean, I do have an email if you want to speak to me, I suppose. Yeah, sure. Um, Tarek G, which is T-A-R-E-C-K-G at gmail.com. But ultimately, I'm... I'm enjoying not being in, in any kind of limelight at the moment, to be honest with you. Okay. Um, I'm happy to talk to people. And if it's been a service, then that's that's the reason why I'm here right now. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I mean, I, I do intend to probably get myself out there and doing the talk last week was very, was a good idea, wasn't it? Yeah, it was a good talk. You should do more of them. And you've made appearances on the Accessible Astrology podcast, right? Yeah. 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 Quite we, should a few. Been, we should have been well received and it's been yeah. good, hasn't it? We've yeah. enjoyed it. Yeah. Um, but yeah, no, I do intend to be um, doing more in the very near future. Good. And shall I let you know? Mm -hmm. Awesome. Yeah, yeah please let us know. Mm -hmm. uh, Lisa, where can people find out more? Yeah, just lisashime.com. Um, look for the written. It's uh, not phonetic, so <laughs> just look for the printed version or I can spell it. <laughs> yeah, I will put a link, a link in the description below this video mm -hmm. and on the description page uh, for this episode on the astrologypodcast.com. Mm-hmm. 
Uh, and as always, you can find me at theastrologypodcast.com. So thanks to all of the patrons who supported the production of this episode and helped us create this awesome studio, which we're finally getting some use out of. Yeah. Um, this is pretty exciting. Yeah, it is. It's awesome. Mm -hmm. Gorgeous. Yeah. So hopefully we'll be back again. Uh, so you can find out more information or sign up for the podcast at theastrologypodcast.com slash subscribe. Otherwise, we'll be back again for episode uh, 202 sometime next week. Mm-hmm. All right. Thanks, everyone, right. for watching. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you. <laughs>